Good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased with the budget development process for our fiscal year 21. And as budget chair and vice chair, Dr. Anderson and I have just concluded our two by two meetings with each of the board members to determine general impressions about the budget, the items that have support or may need um, some discussion, as well as answering any clarifying questions that board members have had. I hope our colleagues have found these meetings to be helpful. In terms of the remaining budget process, as you know, we have completed our public hearing on the budget this week and are slated to adopt the FY21 advertised budget next Thursday, February 6th at our regular meeting. Generally, we request that any amendments that are to be considered should be sent over to the clerk, Eileen Mulberg, by close of business tomorrow and copying Ms. Burden. If you have additional amendments, certainly they will be considered, but we would appreciate receiving them by Monday morning as staff will look to clean up the language and uh, refine them um, to your liking and then be posted for the public. We want to make sure that the amendment language is correct as well as any costing that is associated with that. Amendments are typically posted to our board docs a couple of days prior to the adoption of the advertised budget. So if you, the longer you take with your amendments, um, this could delay the posting uh, for other colleagues to see, as well as the public. Remember that the goal for next Thursday is to adopt the advertised budget that conveys the total need of Fairfax County Schools to the board of supervisors and the public. As some of you may not be aware, the budget development process will continue through the end of May, both at the county and the state levels while they consider priorities and funding. On February 25th, the county executive will present the county's advertised budget to the Board of Supervisors, which will include an assumption of a transfer level to Fairfax County Public Schools. On April 14th, the school will present its fiscal year 21 advertised budget formally to the Board of Supervisors. On May 5th, the Board of Supervisors will approve the F fiscal year 21 budget, including an, if they decide upon an approved tax rate hike and any additional transfer funds to the schools. The Board of Supervisors funding decisions, coupled with the Commonwealth attorneys, or the Commonwealth's final changes to the budget and the Fairfax County Public Schools impact of those final deliberations will result in any additional school board public hearings and additional work sessions so that we can reconcile the advertised budget to the approved funding levels. On May 21st, the school board will adopt the fiscal year approved budget at its regular meeting, and there is a detailed calendar uh, that you will be able to uh, refer to. Again, for tonight's work session, we want to provide an opportunity first for our staff to provide more information about several areas that many of you had had questions. We will have a short presentation uh, from the, on the Instructional Assistant Salary Scale, FCPS On, and the Office of Support Services Reorganization. Many colleagues had asked for line item details about the proposed budget. Line item details will only be provided at the approved budget stage and those documents are typically released in September. More details on the previous year's budget can be helpful, and that information will be found on the FCPS website under the Fiscal 20 approved program budget. At this point, we will be um, asking for our staff to present all three of the subject areas um, that I just referenced, and once uh, staff have given those uh, presentations, uh, Dr. Anderson and I will be uh, taking your questions and comments. So again, you have the lights in front of you to just signal and we will take um, your information in that order. Also keep in mind that um, we will have the school board staff uh, working the clock. So just like any other normal work session, uh, everyone will have their three minutes. Uh, if you stop to ask staff to answer questions during your three-minute time, of course, the clock will stop. In order to avoid um, the buzzer going off, the only way to do that is uh, our uh, staff will 
um, preemptively stop the clock two seconds before your three minutes is up to avoid you getting buzzed. Um, but we uh, appreciate that once you um, recognize that your, your time is completed, and we'll certainly ask you to wrap up to make that easy. Um, Again, before we uh, get started with staff presentations, I would ask my colleagues, does anybody have any clarifying questions about the process I've laid out for this evening? Okay, uh, Dr. Brabrand, I'm turning it over to you and your staff at this time. Thank you, Chairman McLaughlin. Uh, we're glad to be here for this work session and thank you guys for coming. And we have several topics that we want to go over that we knew from follow-up of previous budget work session discussions to go over, and we have uh, a brief description of uh, these areas. As we said, the classroom instructional support scale, FCPS on at the middle school, school support expansion, and we'll make a, uh, a small mention of the program budget. There were some questions about that. This isn't going to be an in-depth presentation. We're going to move through rapidly and just hit some highlights for you. I also want to emphasize that actually all three of these areas have really been multi-year processes. We've been looking at teacher salary scales for multiple years, trying to catch our teachers up to market base, and then this issue about instructional assistance that years ago had salary tied to 50% of a teacher's salary um, became a focus of the board last year. FCPS on is actually something that's been multi-years as well. We started with a state um, uh, grant, an e-learning backpack initiative that gave it to seven high schools, uh, and really with an equity lens, we looked at trying to provide that opportunity for all of our high schools and now consideration for our middle schools. Office of School Expansion is a group that we really had focused on maybe 20 to 30 schools several years ago facing accreditation challenges, and we've widened the, the scope of that to really support all of our schools in the school system to improve high quality tier one instruction, part of our theory of action. So without further ado, we're here to answer any questions after the presentation, and we look forward to supporting and facilitating your discussion of the budget. Uh, it is my honor and pleasure to uh, start off with our Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, Dr. Helen Nixon. Thank you. Good evening, uh, members of the board. A three-year commitment was made to enhance the IA and PHTA salaries to be 50% of the BA teacher scale salaries. The total cost of the enhancement to be realized over a three-year period is $8.1 million. Captured also in this enhancement is the PHA pay to be 12% less than that of the IA and PHTA. And each year of the phase costs $2.7 million. Sorry, there's a tech, there we go. Sorry for the delay. Um, this is a snapshot of the progression from uh, fiscal year 17 to the, project, the projections of FY22. And as we stay on this path by FY22, the starting salary will be $25,502. And in the notes section, it tells you a little bit about um, a description through the um, fiscal year phases. This slide shows the comparison of FCPS to the Wavy schools. Our hope is by FY22, we will have moved from sixth place to fourth place in the Wavy Guide. This chart shows the percentage and count of employees within certain ranges of earnings. The majority of IA and PHT employees, roughly 41.4%, and PHA employees at 83.7% earn less than $30,000. About a third, 34.1% of IA and PHTA employees and 4.1% of PHA employees earn more than $35,000. In fiscal year 18-19, we hired 12 fewer IAs than in FY 17-18, but we hired 15 more PHTAs during that period. And we hired 17 more PHAs in FY 18-19 than in 17-18. 
In terms of our recruiting and hiring, instructional assistant vacancies are generally not difficult to fill. However, some schools find it more challenging to fill roles assigned to work with students who have the greatest needs. Also captured on this slide is a high level view of some of the delineations of what the major duties and responsibilities would be for an instructional assistant, a public health training assistant, and public health assistants. And if the board wanted to see more detailed job descriptions, we could also provide that. But this gives you a high level overview. This chart shows the retention rate for CIS scale employees as compared to the retention rate for teachers over the past three years. Overall, the retention rates for these groups has been similar over this time with the retention rate for CIS scale employees just slightly less than teachers, but generally within 1%. Members of the school board recently inquired about starting IA salaries at $30,000 or $35,000. Starting IA salaries at $30,000 would require increasing the investment in the CIS scale 23.3% from what has been included in the FY21 proposed budget. The cost impact is $35 million. The starting IA salaries at $35,000 would require increasing the investment in the CIS scale 43.9% from what has been included in the FY21 proposed budget, a cost impact of $63.5 million. The goal should be to lift salaries for all employees. This maintains internal equity and avoids compression of the scales. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, if we could go to the next slide, we're gonna transition into FCPS on. Uh, and similar to Dr. Nixon, we wanted to provide some information in response to questions that we received from uh, board members in the last school board work session. You can see kind of the themes that we wanna to touch on here this evening. The first is to provide a little bit more context uh, around the history of the initiative, share some of the program evaluation findings that we've had over the last three years of program evaluations. Uh, we have school leaders with us this evening, seated behind me from the middle school and the high school level that um, would be very happy to address and answer any questions that you might have. And then we also wanna provide some clarification on the funding and the financing model of the initiative. But to get started, we wanted to just discuss a little bit of the background with uh, respect to the goals of the initiative. And the infographic that you see in yellow here really kind of outlines the major goals of uh, the FCPS on initiative. And the first is around equitable access. And I think a lot of people understand in the community the issue of the digital divide and the importance of having equitable access to technology at home. But I think sometimes folks in our community forget that it's just as important that all students have access to technology every day in school as well. Our students are with us, of course, seven hours a day. Um, and in many of our schools that don't have adequate technology, it's difficult for teachers to maybe reserve a computer lab or have laptop carts available when they want to plan technology integrated lessons. So when we think about access, we need to think about access at home as well as at school. The second goal is around portrait of a graduate skills. Um, this initiative from the very beginning has been about really thinking about ways to develop those communication, collaboration, critical and creative thinking skills um, that are so important for 21st century learners. Also, um, we want to make sure that we're preparing all of our students for success in the workforce. And I think we all um, understand today that employers across all industries really expect that um, students um, and future employees are going to have technology fluency. So we want to make sure we're preparing our students for success in college and careers. And then sometimes people forget about our goals around digital citizenship, um, which is one of the primary goals that we're focused on in this initiative. And I think as we've all seen, or at least I can say as a, as a parent of two young students uh, in FCPS public schools, we've seen what goes wrong on social media um, at times, and we wanna make sure that all of our students learn to use technology in safe, responsible, ethical ways. And then professional learning is the final goal. And that's really important because this initiative is not about devices. It uses devices, but it is about teaching and learning. So one of our primary goals is to make sure that all of our educators have opportunities to receive professional development 
that will allow them to design the type of instructional experiences that are gonna help students develop portrait of a graduate skills. And then finally, it's always, I think, important to point out that this is not just a FCPS initiative, this is a county initiative as well. And one of the goals of One Fairfax is to make sure that all of our students um, and all of our citizens have equitable access to technology. So I know there's a lot of information on this slide, but uh, as Dr. Brabrand alluded to the fact that this is an initiative that we've been working on for quite some time, over seven years. And a few things that I wanna highlight and point out here. The initiative really started in the 13, 2013 school year where we joined a cadre of school systems around the country that engaged in extensive research about best practices in using technology to promote student learning and to use technology in effective and efficient ways. And we learned a lot from school systems that had already implemented technology, some around best practices and some around things to not do and mistakes to try to avoid. And we had an opportunity in 2015 to receive a grant from VDOE that allowed us to uh, pilot one-to-one -one laptops in our uh, six high schools that had the largest percentages of economically disadvantaged students. So thinking about that work and understanding that work really led next to the codification in the school board strategic plan Ignite in the 15-16 school year where the board set a goal for one-to-one -one implementation in all of our schools. And that was, I think, largely due to urging by the community to make sure that we we're preparing our students uh, for success. You can see over the intervening years, we had a number of work sessions. Um, in the 16-17 school year, we made the decision to scale the pilot uh, to the Chantilly Pyramid, where we implemented in all of our elementary schools, our middle schools and uh, high school in the Chantilly Pyramid. And I really wanna point out that that year we decided since we were making a significant investment in technology, that we wanted to make sure that we had an independent external evaluation of our work. And we contracted with Johns Hopkins University um, to provide program evaluation services and they've done so for the last four years uh, and will continue to do so in the, in the coming years. And then you can see um, we had a number of school board work sessions on the topic. We had five community engagement meetings, one in every region. And in the 18-19 school year, um, the board decided to include the expansion to all high schools, and we implemented uh, FCPS on in all of our high schools this school year. So a few things about the evaluation findings uh, from Johns Hopkins University. All of the f uh, full reports are posted and linked here, so you can take a look at them. Um, but this is a mixed method evaluation that's really comprehensive. It involves surveys, it involves interviews, it involves focus groups, and it involves classroom observations. So we asked Johns Hopkins to kind of summarize into one slide some of the key findings. Um, and the first significant area is there's a positive impact that's been demonstrated on how students learn. In particular, using technology has increased student engagement in classrooms. We see more differentiation of instruction because we know not all students learn at the same rate and at the same pace. And technology gives us an opportunity to really target instruction and align instruction um, to individual student learning needs. And we've seen a lot of student ownership of learning because students have an opportunity to have access to their course materials all day and at home, and they don't um, really suffer from some of the same issues. If you forget something, you leave it at home, or you forget something, you leave it at school. They've got access um, 24 hours a day if they need it. And the other key area is a significant impact on student skills and, and achievement. And here it's important, again, to underscore that the focus is on portrait of a graduate skills. There's a lot of things that we do in education where we use standardized assessments to measure learning. And multiple choice standardized assessments are not the only way to measure student learning. We can look at samples of student work. We can look at presentations, portfolios that demonstrate student growth over time. And technology gives us an opportunity to do those things and work with students in a way that really do develop their creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. Also, um, we've seen positive impacts on student achievement for some of our more vulnerable subgroups, our students with disabilities and our English language learners. And we've seen um, an increase in student skills, especially computer skills as well. Just a few things that I wanna point out in terms of survey results. I'll go through these very quickly. Um, you see here uh, sample survey results when we ask teachers about the use of technology in their classroom and you see 763 respondents um, participated in the last survey. These are just a few examples of large percentages of teachers 
talking about the importance of technology and supporting their instructional delivery um, and how it's contributed positively to student engagement in their classrooms. We surveyed over 5,000 students, and again, you see that a lot of students support um, for using technology to encourage their responsibility in the learning process, and a large percentage of students say it would be difficult to be successful without the devices. We had 1,300 parents respond to our survey, and again, um, overwhelmingly, parents uh, talk about the need for children to be exposed to technology in the learning process and the integral nature of the FCPS On initiative uh, in their children's learning experiences. So I mentioned that we have some school leaders. Uh, these are the folks behind me, um, principals and school-based technology specialists from the various schools here that would be happy to talk to you if there's uh, interest and time permitting about some of the benefits that they see from the initiative, which are captured on this slide. And then one of the things that you asked about is what are we doing to make sure that schools are ready? And that is a phenomenal question because we don't start the initiative when computers are delivered to classrooms. We start the initiative an entire school year before devices are ever delivered. And we work with a team of leaders and teachers from the school who receive professional development resources and support to provide turnaround training in their, in their schools around blended learning strategies, digital citizenship, and strategies to establish their classroom procedures and routines so they don't have to worry about how to manage the devices. And down at the bottom in the last bullet, I really want to underscore that one of the things we've been working with teachers is around uh, making sure that we have a balanced use of technology, not an over-reliance on technology. Technology is great for many things, and it's critical for many learning strategies and opportunities, but there's other ways to learn. Um, and we've provided resources and guidance for teachers to make good decisions about when to use technology and when to use more traditional methods. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Mary Beth, who's going to talk a little bit about the technology device side preparation. So in addition to making sure that our teacher, teachers are ready through professional development, we also did a significant amount of work in planning with our schools to make sure that the technology distribution it went smoothly. So one of the things, for example, we did in the 18-19 school year was identifying the device specifications and testing of many different devices before we selected the one we did. We also went through a full competitive process in terms of identifying the best device at the, at the least expensive cost. One of the things we also did was had site surveys at every high school to make sure we had the bandwidth, wireless access capacity, network drops, et cetera, and made improvements as needed based on that evaluation. We did consultation meetings with every high school to share the best practices from our pilots and identifying areas for laptop receiving and storage and distribution. We had a timelines for delivery for every school so that we could uh, balance that out throughout the, the summertime, including we had individual school team planning meetings with IT as well as our vendor, our, our hardware vendor. Information from principals on recommending local technology purchases was provided to each school, for example, shelving and extra chargers and those kind of things that they would be ready for success. We also established a process for device pickup, repair, and redeployment throughout the school year. One of the things we also did was implementing a brand new internet content filtering system for student protection that worked both in school and out of school when they took the devices home. So that was an additional capability that we added during for our take home devices. We also made sure that all of our software contracts had confidentiality addendums in terms of our procurement process. Logistically, in terms of we've had some how did it go, it went extremely well. We, ha we uh, deployed 59,583 devices to all of our high school students. Out of that, 277, which is uh, less than a half of a percent, uh, chose to BYOD instead of accepting the FCPS device. For breakage and repair, based on our high school data so far, um, well, for over half the year so far, we've had only 4.6% of all the high school devices have required repair. All of those repairs have been covered by our warranties. The way our warranty works is FCPS staff conducts those repairs, and then we are reimbursed by the vendor. On average, um, the devices are retrieved, repaired, and returned to the schools within five days, which is a large benefit to not having to be sending them back to the vendor and then returned. And so that 4.6% has worked very well because we had allocated 5% of the total number of high school student laptops, made those available at the schools for, to accommodate devices when they were out on repair. So we have not had the situation where students went without a device if their device had been broken or misplaced. We've also been asked about lost and stolen devices. Um, we have had 93, 93 devices have been reported lost or stolen. That's about 0.2% 
44 of those devices have already been found. One of the things that we do when a device has been reported is that we put a, a ping on our network, and the next time anybody turns on that device anywhere in the FCPS network, it'll show up in an alert to us. So we can, so for example, a student left it in the gym or they left it at another school at a game or something like that. As soon as that device is turned on, we can find it. So of those 93 devices already, 44 have already been found. 42 are in the process that we, we, we basically give it about 30 days before we consider them lost, actually lost. And so out of the 59,000, we've had seven that have been permanently lost, which is a very small uh, percentage. One of the things that we've also been doing as we've continued in this rollout, we continually do lessons learned about what things that we have, have learned from our process. We've done that through the pilot as well as the current high school rollout. One of the things that has been very, very important, as Sloan mentioned, is that we have our learning innovation teams and ensure that we have professional development prior to the rollout. We are currently doing that with middle school. We have learned distribution best practices to make sure that we, for example, identifying a secure storage and imaging place prior to delivery was very important. Delivery of, of devices in early July was also very essential so that we have them ready as soon as the students come back. Adequate T-spec support is e at each school is critical. And we also looked at making sure that we don't distribute devices to students until the master schedule is finalized. That's something that we've learned. In-class distribution has generally been easier for students and staff, but we continue to, to discuss that with our different schools in preparation for next year's distribution. One of the other lessons learned that we had this year is that we needed to align the IEP accommodations with the data fee that we, su that we supplied to financial services for assessing the fee. Those, the correction for 1,510 students has occurred in terms of the fees being either returned or refunded the money. We're talking about how FCPS on will impact middle school students, which we've talked about in terms of enhancing the learning, student learning outcomes, increasing equity of access, as we've discussed about, and resolving in, in instructional challenges due to the aging technology. One of the things I wanted to remind the board that this initiative includes an automatic refresh of every four years. One of the big challenges we have had historically in our schools is we have not had a, a funding for replacing equipment after it becomes aging. And so we have a lot of technology in our schools that is five, 10, sometimes more than 10 years old. And so many of our carts and old equipment that is not part of FCPS on takes a very long time to boot up. And so when some of our teachers try to use a mobile cart that has very aging technology, it can take a significant portion of the instructional period to even get those old machines to turn on. One of the things I also wanted to mention is these one-to-one -one devices are also used for all of our SOL testing. And so having adequate devices so that we can do all of our, our testing is important. And the <coughs> equipment that we had in our high schools that has been moved down to others is reliant on those one-to-one -one in order to do testing. We've been asked about other divisions. And so really FCPS is really behind the, the times in terms of one-to-one. -one. Here's an example of some of the one-to-one -one, uh, divisions in Virginia and many of our districts. And as we've seen in terms of surveys is that 99 out of 126 divisions have responded that they have one-to-one -one programs. So many, many schools across the country as well as in Virginia already have one-to-one -one initiatives. Overall budget considerations, as I mentioned, I wanted to, to remind you that this funding model really represents an equitable and efficient use of the dollars. We have reallocated a significant amount of funding. This is not all new money that we are requesting. Um, the cost of FCPS on is spread over multiple years through the leasing of devices. Um, as I said, the funding model includes a four-year refresh, which we have never had in FCPS. We've never had adequate funding to re refresh our devices, especially student devices. The majority of funding sources come from several different areas. The majority of the existing central office REOC money, which is our the REOC e replacement equipment money that we did have for some replacement has been reallocated to this initiative. A portion of the school instructional materials been in collaboration with our school principals has been reallocated to fund the FCPS on. And then the two other components is the $50 student technology fee. And we wanted to make sure that everyone is aware that that is reduced or waived for students according to their free and reduced meal status and or their IEP status now. And the FY21 funding that has been talked about includes not just middle school, but the half of it is the lease payments for the existing high school laptops that have already been deployed. I'm going to turn this back now to uh, Alice and Lee for the specific details on the, on the expenditure and finance components. Good evening. Um, I'm first going to go over the uh, funding model for FCPS on high school. 
Um, there have been misperceptions in the community surrounding the FCPS on uh, funding formula, and I hope to lay those to rest tonight. This chart shows the six-year cost of high school FCPS on, and the reason this is six years instead of the typical five years is because a significant amount of funding uh, was set aside in fiscal 19, the year prior to implementation. Uh, the total cost of this first phase of FCPS on high school is 44.9 million. The table in front of you shows expenditures broken out by major category. The total cost of the devices is 31.4 million with 9.2 million for outright purchases and 22.4 million in lease costs. The lease funding pays for the initial purchase and then we make lease payments of 5.6 million for four years starting in fiscal 21 and ending in fiscal 24. So we purchase the devices in fiscal 20 and lease payments always start the year after the purchase. The majority of the funds for outright purchases came from funds set aside in previous years for that purpose. We purchased approximately 60,000 devices at about $500 per device. And that price also includes accidental damage protection to additional battery replacements outside the warranty period. Again, the lease funding paid for the purchase of about 70% of the devices and funds we had set aside in advance covered the remaining 30%. Accessories and prep services are one-time costs for laptop sleeves to protect our investment, packaging and prep services like affixing barcodes, that sort of thing. The positions added include 16.5 T-SPEC positions and two educational specialists, all to provide school-based support. 17 high schools saw an increase of a 0.5 position and eight high schools received an increase of one position, again, for a, a total of 17.5. 16.5. The cost of the positions is 2.3 million per year or a total over this first phase of 9.2 million. Professional development and program evaluation includes an external evaluation and the use of a national evaluation tool to support the initiative as well as professional development. As far as the revenue goes, over 60% of the funds displayed here to support FCPS on high school are from new revenue sources or repurposed funds from existing sources. The technology support fee is $50, $25 for um, reduced price lunch, and $0 depending, again, on, on free lunch eligibility and IEP status. Those fees are paid by parents, so that is a new revenue source, and that generates about $2.2 million per year. The school carryover funding is one-time funds paid by the high schools across two years out of their existing funds and represents 75% of their carryover funding or about $25 per pupil for two years. The repurposed textbook per pupil is an annual repurposing of 25% of school textbook funds at $23.50 per pupil <laughs> out of 94 is what they get for textbooks, which generates about 1.4 million annually. Repurposed replacement equipment funds and one-time funds reflect funds set aside in earlier years and replacement equipment funds for refreshes of school computer labs that will no longer be needed. So as far as new funding goes, the fiscal 20 budget impact was $2 million. That was the increase for FCPS on in the fiscal 20, this current year's budget. For fiscal 21, it's 4.8 million. So we already had the 2 million built into the base for this year. So the increase is 2.8 million as far as new resources go. Fiscal 22 is 5.4 million, but we will have built in the 4.8 from fiscal 20 and 21. So that's 0.6 million and then the total is zero in fiscal 23 as it's 5.4 again. And again, this is the first phase or typically a five year of the high school program totaling 44.9 million. The middle school is uh, pretty much exactly like I just told you with the high school, except for this is a five year cost and the total cost of this first phase is 19.7 million. The devices are 16 million that are all to be funded with lease funds. The lease funding pays for the initial purchase in fiscal 21, and then we'll make lease payments of 4 million per year for four years, 22, 23, 24, and 25. 
it will purchase the devices in 21. Lease payments always start a year after the purchase. We'll be purchasing uh, 31,000 devices at about $500 per device. And again, that includes the accidental damage protection, um, bat extra batteries, that sort of thing. Uh, we also have accessories and prep services as one-time costs uh, for the laptop sleeves and the barcoding. And as far as positions go, we have four T-SPEC positions at a 0.5 position at eight middle schools, again, to provide school-based support at an annual cost of 0.5 million or a total of 2 million. And then, of course, there's some professional development and program evaluation funds, just as with the high school. As far as the revenue goes, over 50% of the funds displayed support FCPS on middle school, and that's the part that's from new revenue sources or repurpose funds from existing sor sources. Again, the technology support fee, 50, 25, or zero, depending on free and reduced status or IEP status, and that should generate 1.1 million per year. The school carryover funding is one-time funds to be paid by the middle schools across two years um, at $39 per pupil. The principals are, are very aware um, that this is coming, uh, assuming you know, if, the, if the board uh, approves this initiative. And then the repurposed textbook per pupil is an annual repurposing of school textbook funds at $19 out of 76 per pupil, or about a half a million dollar annually, or two million for the complete phase. And again, repurposed replacement equipment funds um, are previously for refreshes of school computer labs that will no longer be needed. And so these funds have been redirected to support, F or will be redirected to support FCPS on middle school. The FY21 budget impact is 1.1 million, but that is offset by 1.1 million in tech support fees uh, or revenue. FY22 will require new funding of 2.3 million. FY23 is also 2.3 million, so that'll already be in the base, as is fiscal 24 and 25. Thus, no new resources will be needed after that fiscal 20 uh, original uh, new funding of 2.3 million. The total cost of the FCPS on middle school is 19.7 million. And um, last, to close out our um, presentation this evening, there were some questions on the proposed expansion of the Office of School Support. Currently, the Office of School Support is one of seven offices and departments in the Chief Equity Office. The proposal uh, made by the superintendent is to take the Office of School Support and the work they've been doing to provide differentiated, intense supports to schools and to uh, incorporate that and look at it more holistically to make sure that we're providing supports in a way that is clearly for instruction, but also looking at and understanding other elements that go into an effective school. So the proposal before uh, in the proposed budget uh, outlines that now this Office of School Support would be a part of a Department of School Improvement and Supports. In that Department of School Improvement and Supports, you'll see here on the org chart, there would, that would consist of four main offices. The offices that are in a blue are the existing offices that, that are in the positions that are currently in uh, the budget, so they're not an additional ask. The ones in blue that you see are the Office of Secondary School Support and the Office of Elementary School Support, and that would be most of the main functions that we currently see in the Office of School Support and through, as many board members have heard, the Project Momentum. So that work would continue. To enhance that office, you'll see that underneath, and this is where all the boxes that are in green, those are all current existing positions and offices or that exist in the budget. So again, this is not additional ask in the budget. These are simply offices that we are proposing to be moved under this new department to again, better align our supports for schools. So you'll see under the Office of School Support, a program, a multi-tier systems of support, or as we call it, MTSS, which is really a framework of how we support schools and how schools support students looking at three lenses, looking through behavioral supports, instruction, and also social-emotional. This program currently exists in the Department of Special Services and would be reorganized under the Office of School Support to, again, look at that holistic view of how we're helping all of our schools achieve success for each and every student. The middle column is an office of traditional uh, schools and uh, non-traditional schools and programs, which also currently exists in the Department of S S uh, Special Services. 
This particular office, again, is all green, meaning these are all existing positions that would be reorganized to have this Department of School Improvement and Supports provide the same level of support to our um, non-traditional schools and programs that they're currently providing to all of our K-12 comprehensive schools. The third column is the Office of Assessment and Reporting, which currently is under Instructional Services. This particular office uh, helps provide support around our test administration, but also more and more are helping us to be provide, helping us provide clear data that's actionable for schools and for uh, op central offices to make sure we're making the best decisions around how we're supporting our schools and our students and our teachers. So this again would be a part of the notion that the department has the support aspect. The fourth and fi final office is the Office of Student Activities and Athletic Programs, which is currently already in the Chief Equity Office, but would be aligned under this department to again look at holistically what are we doing to provide supports for schools and make sure that we are doing everything we can um, so that students receive the best education possible. So in the budget, you will see that there are really uh, the ask for a couple of positions, and that's what you see in orange. So the orange, the big uh, one on the top, which is the assistant superintendent, is a reclassified position because it takes a current position, the uh, position of executive director of Office of School Support, and reclassifies that. So it's not a new position per se, but it's a reclassified one. That with our assistant superintendents does come um, an, an, education, an executive um, administrat administrative assistant, or EAA, so that is a new position. So that is one complete new position. And what you don't see reflected on the chart because the org chart is more high level is there is also two additional resource teacher positions. In the Office of School Support, we have uh, regional teams uh, that support our schools that, and we have resource teachers focused on language arts, math, special education, our equity support. And uh, in this um, proposal, in this reorganization, there would be one additional resource teacher for Region 2 team and one additional for Region 3 team. Again, those aren't reflected on this org chart because we only have the higher, we have the higher part of each office listed here. And with that, I believe we are, turn it back to Lee to close out. So as, um Ms. McLaughlin indicated there have been a lot of questions about um, getting line item detail about the budget and we do not produce a line item detail budget at the proposed or the advertised level, only at the um, approved level. Um, but with that, we do provide quite a bit of detail online as well as a program budget. Um, and that program budget for fiscal 20 uh, might prove helpful um, for your desire to have greater detail about expenditures. So if we can go to the next slide, um, I'm just going to, this is what a typical chart looks like in the program budget. Um, and again, this is out of the fiscal 20 program budget, and it's for middle school core programs. Uh, the program budget shows two years of data, uh, fiscal 19, fiscal 20, and it's broken out by school-based and non-school-based positions and dollars, the majority of which, of course, is school-based. The line items are distributed by position classes like administrator, specialist teachers, assistants, office staff, and custodial, and the dollar amounts represent the salaries. After you see all those position classifications, um, there's funding for hourly salaries, as well as a credit for work for others, and that's just an expenditure credit for a county reimbursement um, and for grant indirect costs, those kinds of things that reduce the expenditures for middle schools. And then employee benefits um, for the positions that, are, that you see above, and then operating expenses, which are just non-salary costs. Um, the total positions um, are uh, 1,787.6 um, in fiscal 20 uh, compared to 1,777.4 in fiscal 19. So there was an increase of uh, about 10 positions. The majority of those are teachers and a couple of custodians, and of course all of them are, are school-based increases. Then the, at the bottom is the total expenditures and offsetting revenue and this, the 750000 or so that's offsetting revenue, um, represents the SOL algebra readiness funding that we get for the state, from the state for um, support of middle schools. And then the net cost 
uh, in the school operating fund. So in fiscal 19, the middle school PAR program was about 200 million. It's about 207 in fiscal 20, um, looking at the net cost. Um, you can, you know, if you have interest in this and, and go to the program budget, you know, feel free to, you know, give me a call if you have a question or need more help in understanding it. That, that is the uh, completion of our staff presentations, and we look forward to assisting the board in any way for the remainder of your program tonight. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Brabrand and um, leadership team members for the presentations. Um, at this point, colleagues, uh, I did not see anyone flip their lights, so we... She, she's read first. Okay, so we have uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders. You are first, followed by Mayor, uh, Ms. Keys Gamara. Okay. Thank you. Um, first, before we go delve into the budget, I do want uh, my colleagues to know that we have a wonderful visitor here tonight. Uh, we have a young man from, um, let me give you the troop number, Troop 114, Mr. Malik Swalim who is working on his community merit badge. And we are just so thrilled that you are engaged in um, pursuit of this activity. So welcome tonight. Um, and with that, I do have one question I, and some comments. I really appreciate the brief overview that has been provided on uh, these issues tonight. I am um, intrigued with the IA salaries. I when. I, the presentation up there, I want to make sure everybody knows, is just the starting IA salary because in your packet you have the whole scale and the commitment to get to 50% of the um, teacher's salary within two more years. But to get there, and this is my question, Ms. Burden, to get there in one year uh, where we have a $2.7 million investment for the second year this year, it, and another $2.7 million next year. Are you suggesting we could get there with $5.4 million this year? Yes. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, let my colleagues know that I think that is a priority. If we can accelerate it to this year, it would be great. Um, secondly, I do want to talk a little bit about the Office of School Support and how they work with my schools, because I think many people don't know about the work that they have been doing in the, in the schools in my community. Um, and uh, as many of you know, I have a high density of uh, schools that have students who come to us with lots of different backgrounds, come to us with uh, some significant um, challenges, and uh, we had a number of our schools the first year I was on the board. We had 13 of my schools not fully accredited. And it was with the very dedicated support of the Office of School Support working in our schools as instructional coaches, as uh, putting together intervention plans for uh, specific subject areas, reviewing the data intensely, and working in partnership with the school-based personnel that those schools were able to become fully accredited. Uh, as many of you know, all of our schools are, um, with the exception of one, which is a single grade, um, are now academically fully accredited. We do have um, some non-academic um, concerns with the dropout rate, which are, um, are a significant challenge because of the, the challenges our students come to us with at later ages. Um, but the Office of School Support has been very intentional and worked in tandem with our school-based personnel uh, to go from 13 schools not fully accredited to a single grade, and we're going to resolve that issue because um, that is a school which only had one grade to be accredited. It was a, um, it was a, I would like to say an experiment of um, having the only school in the county that was a K through three. 
uh, and all the other schools that are split are four to six and K through two. Um, but the Office of School Support has been just an incredible um, team that have gone into our schools to work with our staff. And so I will say that I am very supportive of not only our continued funding and expansion, but also the expansion of that effort because we know that um, the uh, the state is becoming is expecting even greater rigor from our schools. And thank you, are. thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Um, we oh, were sorry. having issues with the clock, so okay, uh, thanks. Um, we probably had you talking for six minutes, not for three, but it's okay. It, no, no, there's it's not on your part. We're trying to see if we can get the clock to work. So, I figured no sense in skipping to the next board member, and everything you said was meaningful. So, we're all good. Uh, we'll. Just board members, if you're having any trouble at all, also seeing the clock, um, please work please I signal. Work yeah, no, um, we'll, Ms. or Dr. Anderson, I'll work out the clock part. Just at this point, um, we have on deck Ms. Keith Gamara, followed by uh, Laura J. Cohen, and then I see uh, Ms. Yeah. Tolan, and then Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Okay, um, I, I've got a couple of areas of concern, and I guess I will start with the Office of Support. I think that was on page, if we could pull it up there, because I want to have a greater understanding, and I didn't, I don't, I'm not sure when this was posted, but this is the first time uh, I have seen it. Where are my notes? Is it up there? Okay, so, um, Help, if somebody could help me understand um, the Office of School Support consists now, is it of the, the blue squares? Is correct. That, That's it, correct. It's the blue squares. Okay. And then what additional employees would be added? In, and, and this, well, let, let me back up. The green squares are what already exists, right? In other departments or offices, they already exist, and they're being reorganized under this new department. Are they all under one department right now? No. The middle one is under Department of Special Services. The next one is under Instructional Services. And the last one is under the, just under Equity Office as a whole. Okay. And the, of the blue that is the Office of uh, School Support right now, how many employees are we talking about? Do we know? I can, I don't know the, t the number right off the top of my head, but I can get it to you. It's about 50, I think, is that correct? It's about, about 50. It's about 50. Okay. It's about 50. Uh, and do we have any demographic information for those employees in terms of, because they're serving our most diverse students, so does, does that department reflect the diversity in the challenging I communities? I can get you that. that. I, I did see you asked a budget question on that. I can get you that information for the, we do have obviously a breakdown of, of the different okay. employees. Okay. And, um, I'm assuming this was posted, what, yesterday or this morning or? Is that, okay. All right, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to take a deeper look at it in terms of, I guess I'm trying to understand um, the rationale of bringing it all together as opposed to different um, departments. And currently the only people under you, Dr. Duran, are the three blue or? No. Um all of these would be under the equity office as a whole, except for the Office of Assessment and Reporting, which was under the office until very recently and had been prior. So all of these are in some way under the equity office as a whole. But remember, under the equity office, there are seven offices and departments. And so okay. these all exist for the most part in one of those seven offices or departments. This is creating a brand new department that has a specific intentional focus on school improvement and supports and pulling these various offices from offices or departments that currently already exist to make it more aligned and to have more of a, a cohesive approach to how we support schools. Okay, so I, I guess at some point, and maybe this isn't, I'll get the answer at some point, but I'm, obviously there was some, some motivation to pull yes. them from where they were, noticing some deficits to bring them to this proposal, and I guess I'm trying to understand those deficits. It wasn't necessarily the deficits per se, it was the focus that we wanna make sure that we are more aligned in one department 
obviously our goal is to make sure that all of our schools are successful and so right. the intention behind this was what are various offices and departments that could be aligned under this new department that would be able to be have a specific focus of helping our schools be successful okay I'm assuming, for example, hypothetically, because I don't know the intricacies of these departments or the, the various offices, that perhaps one has noticed that if one were close, more closely aligned with one of the other green boxes, rather than having to go through some other correct. hoops, that that perhaps is what's behind it. So absolutely, correct. I was trying to understand that, and yes. perhaps at some point. Maybe I'm you happy, can. Yeah, I'm happy to talk further offline if you want with you and explain okay. in further detail. Okay, that's, that's what that. I'd like to understand, and I am concerned as we are serving very diverse uh, groups, um, how much is this that is existing reflecting those groups? And, you know, I do have some ongoing concerns about our hiring. Okay. Um, I've got 19 seconds, so I'll just take a, a go back for my additional questions. Thank you, Ms. Keys Gamara. Uh, I have Ms. Cohen, followed by Ms. Tolan, followed by Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Uh, I have some additional FCPS on questions, um, and I know one will need just probably getting back at some point, but the rationale for um, devices that go home as opposed to class sets. Um, another question I had about has the IEP been fixed where there's a box like I did my child on Friday and I did not see any area to indicate um, where technology is there so I want to make sure that we're not going to have this problem again even at the ninth grade level with new ninth graders um, of the 99 school divisions that you all use at one-to-one -one, is that one-to-one -one at high school is it one-to-one -one at high school and middle school is it one-to-one at all levels. Who has the clicker? Um, and then the final question is how many how many families have paid the fifty dollars and not FRM related, I mean of ones who are expected to pay. Um, and will lack of payment hold up transcripts and hold up graduation caps and gowns and those are my questions. So I think those are great questions. Um, it will take several of us to answer the different components of those. So I think maybe I would start with your first question um, regarding why we would want students to take the devices home. Um, and it, of course, is just an issue of access, right? I mean, getting all the way back to the one Fairfax goal of making sure that all of our students and families have access um, to the internet and all of the educational opportunities um, that that creates at home as well as at school. So a lot of our students, um, even if they have computers at home, one of the things that we found um, during the pilot phase was they might not have the access that they need when they need to be able to use the device. For example, you might have a family of four and you might have one or two devices um, and mom or dad might be working on the computer doing work and the student didn't have the opportunity uh, to access that device and those learning materials when they needed to do so. So really I think the idea of the one-to-one -one device is flexibility and opportunity to deploy technology more eff efficiently across the system. So not thinking about devices tied up in computer labs, not thinking about devices lo locked up in one-to-one -one carts that have limited use, but when we can replace those devices with devices that can be used with more frequency, we're optimizing the resources um, that we're investing in those devices. So that would really be the main rationale for the home question. And then you had another, uh, several other questions, which I think I'll turn over um, to some of my colleagues. I think uh, Martin Grimm was going to talk to a little bit about the uh, one-to-one -one laptops in terms of the equity and having them different between the carts and having them come home. So uh, <clears throat> being a secondary school, you know, we have middle school with 7 through 12. And so a couple, a couple of the issues with uh, bringing them home and then also the difference between having them in the classroom versus being able to take them home. Uh, the, the slowness of the classroom sets, uh, even if you assign one profile per student and a teacher has five profiles, it takes anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes to get them to, to boot up. Uh, looking at families, so I, I've actually had several families at different community events at the school say, my high school student has a device and my middle school student is fighting to get the device because we have one computer at home or we have four kids at home. 
and so the the ability for different kids to be able to access at home. And I would say the last piece of it is <clears throat> uh, accessibility from a differentiation point of view is really important. Um, when students take homework home, I think one of the biggest things about homework that I believe students don't finish their homework is that sometimes they don't understand the work. And it's, it's, they can do the work with the teacher there, but they have a hard time doing the work uh, when they're by themselves. One of the, the things that the laptops allow us to do is to differentiate, and I'll just give a, a, a generic uh, example of the respiration, cell respiration. What the laptops allow us to do is to give varying different uh, reading levels. So you can have a fifth grade reading, reading level, you can have a on grade reading level, and you could have a college reading, reading level all on the same laptop. So in the classroom, students can't tell the difference between reading levels. They don't have different books. But then when they take them home, they're still getting vocabulary at a fifth grade level that helps them understand the concept of cell respiration, regardless of the reading level. So I think the piece about being able to take home has a lot to do with homework, too. And I know a concern of all of us is the amount of homework students have. If you can do the homework faster and more efficiently, if you can understand what you're reading, you don't spend two hours reading something that should take 30 minutes. And I think the, the ability to differentiate there is uh, probably the biggest th factors that we see. One of the specific questions you asked about whether the, what the grade levels were, here are the grade levels we have for each of these schools that were some of the larger school districts in Virginia. So in basically almost all, actually in all the cases, they did, did include middle school. In some cases, they went down to the elementary level. Right, I'm sorry, I was asking not about those specifically, because you guys said 99 out of the 126. We could provide you the full list. Um, th again, those are I much smaller divisions, but. Sure, sure, but I just mean generally, is there, generally have. have it, it varies have, widely. So, I mean, I, some, some divisions, they have done it with just, um, just at high school. Some have gone all the way to the elementary. Some have it in all grade levels. So it will vary. So we can certainly get you the, the specific list of all of those that we have then according to that survey. No, I just the wanted video. to know if there was a, a pattern of. It's a mix, but m many of them have middle, at least middle and high. And a, lot of them have elementary. and a lot of them do have elementary grades as well. And then the last two about the IEPs and the families about have paying the fifty dollars. Um, so far, for high school, one point three million has been collected of the two point two. Um, I. Uh, in total. Okay. So what happens to those kids then who So they they are not paid. prevented from graduation. They are handled just like any other outstanding uh, debt such as uh, textbooks that they have lost and or outstanding fees and those kind of things. So nobody is re is is kept from graduating for example. So they handle it just the way and maybe we can in terms of how different high schools oh, High schools handle outstanding uh, fees. Do you all, anybody up there want to, Jamie, do you or Martin, you want to talk about how we handle students that haven't paid their PE fees or their, or their yearbook fees or their? I think um, we work with individual families throughout that process. So for each year, we collect, you know, what we have a program that tracks kind of what fees are missing. I can say from personal experience, I've never withheld a child from walking or receiving their cap and gown for any fees that they would pay. And I feel confident that our colleagues would agree with that statement. Yes, I, the other thing, um, along the way we have different events where we ask students to be caught up on their prom, homecoming, those types of things. So there's checks, checks along the way. And typically, um, I think all of the principals would agree, we're not going to stop a kid from walking across a, a stage because of something. We usually work out a deal, but I would say 99.9% .9 either find a way to pay. It's amazing how many books are found from freshman year when the cap and gown is waiting for them. And then uh, the rest, we, we work through it with them, but we don't stop them. Right, but books are different than 50 bucks, right? Yeah, well, yeah we, we also, part, we recover a lot of parking fees too, so. Um, and then the IEP, is that Teresa? Thanks. 
We are working with the vendor, uh, our EduPoint, our vendor, our IEP vendor with our, with our electronic system called CSTARS, and we're trying to develop a mechanism so that we can easily have a checkbox in the IEP in order to, um, that would speak to then finance and uh, that people would not be, families would not be charged. I'm good, I'll save it for go backs. Thanks. Okay, before uh, we go on to uh, Ms. Tolan, I do want to just provide uh, a little bit of clarity to my colleagues. I apologize if uh, this format created a little bit of um, confusion. Uh, the way that this three-hour work session is going to uh, be conducted, you right now are not required to have to tailor your questions just to the three presentations we received, you are more than welcome to speak to any issues about the budget. Make your remarks to your fellow colleagues and Dr. Brabrand about where you are on the budget. Uh, we just had found in the two by twos that people had um, sort of coalesced around those three areas with wanting more data. So we wanted to just bring it to everyone in that manner. But please know you can speak to anything starting right now. You don't have to keep it to just the three presentations. The other thing I do want to just also reassure colleagues is that, um, as was stated in a prior work session, this is a massive budget. It's $3.2 billion, and uh, two-thirds of the board is brand new to this role. So um, in less than a month's time from when the superintendent presented this to when we're going to vote on the advertised, it's not a lot of time for all 12 of us to be able to work with each other, work with the superintendent, and ask those really deep questions about a complex budget. So the goal here tonight is to get an idea of what are the things that are most concerning to you that um, you would want to say to us as your colleagues and to the superintendent, I can't vote a week from now with the budget looking like this. These are amendments I'm going to put forward because I, I'm conflicted about the proposed budget as it stands, but also I want to reassure you um, in talking to our CFO, Lee Burden, and also um, Superintendent Braybrand and my experience from the past, even if we vote for the proposed budget with limited change, it does not mean that this board stops its work. We will continue to work from February to May, continuing to examine and refine this budget to what we believe is the best way to target the, the um, funds that we will receive from the Board of Supervisors. The, the most macro level question I can explain to you is, do we believe that we need this 4.2% increase from the county in order to meet the needs of the division? And so unless there are things that you've seen in the budget and you say, that's just not a way to spend money at this point in time. You're certainly welcome to make those amendments. But otherwise, I want to reassure you, you will have a lot more time, all of us together. And that's important, and the public should expect that of us. So Ms. Tolan, you're uh, up next. OK, so given that, I'm going to organize um, my comments. First, I would like to mention a couple of things that are not in the budget, um, and then I'll, I'll talk about things that I support in, in specific questions on what we just talked about. Uh, so a couple of things that are not currently in the budget that I think are important is um, in coordination with our work on the budget, we're also looking at the capital improvement um, program, and um, we have uh, come across a lot of questions and concerns around the um, capacity numbers that it, um, at the schools, and so one of the things I would like to propose as a budget amendment is um, increasing the number of analysts in our Office of Planning um, in order to, because we are also talking about, and we'll be talking at our um, meeting with the Board of Supervisors next week, a more coordinated effort between the school board and the Board of Supervisors and the county offices in looking more in depth at information around you know, permitting, zoning, et cetera, to make sure that we have, uh, the school district has the best information possible for um, projecting our capacity numbers. So I would like to um, put in an amendment for two, uh, at least two analysts in the Office of Planning. 
and I have that question to the budget department to come up with um, what that would cost. Um, in relationship to, to our um, uh, schools at over capacity, that uh, takes a long time for them to move through the renovation queue. Um, uh, I've had a couple of conversations with people, uh, McLean High School in particular, we need to renovate the bathrooms. Um, and make some changes in the bathrooms. And I don't think McLean is necessarily the only high school that has that issue. We do have an estimate just for the 12 bathrooms at McLean of $1.4 million. So it's expensive, but um, perhaps we need to look at part of our, um, you know, expenditures as overall, you know, bathroom renovations around the county for those high schools that were built 20 some years ago and haven't had the bathrooms renovated. Um, all right, I'm running low on time. Uh, one of the things I would like to just mention and I'll do on my go backs is um, I fully support the addition of the assistant director of student activities and would even look to perhaps upping that to one FTE this year. I know it's a two year plan to get there. Um, but I just think that the value that um, after school and various activities uh, present for our, you know, overall well-being of our students is incredible. So I'd like to see that increased. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Uh, I now have uh, Ms. Sizemore Heiser, followed by Ms. Pekarski, and then Mr. Frisch. Um, thank you very much. I would like to speak a little bit to the restraint and seclusion compliance specialist. Um, that we're adding and sort of what I would like to have seen in this budget regarding um, restraint and seclusion, uh, regarding special education. I feel like a compliance specialist, it's important to make sure we're complying with our new regulations that may be coming down the pike, but we need support, not just compliance for our special education department. And I don't see a focus on support for our students in their classroom. And I'll just give you some examples of some history of, of what's happened in our special education department. We used to have 26 inclusion resource teachers. Um, they were changed to, I believe, 10 behavioral intervention teachers in 2008, 2009. We added eight more wonderfully last year, but behavioral intervention teachers, while we're very well needed and important, are a reactive measure to when students are already having behavioral issues and potentially and maybe a BIP is in place, but it's a reactive measure. The inclusion resource teachers were really there to be proactive inclusion supports for our twice exceptional students, for other students to help them be included and help our classroom teachers and administrators know how to have their classrooms and their schools be friendly to inclusion of students with disabilities. And I would like to see more proactive support for our students with disabilities in this budget. So I would like to put a budget amendment in to bring 10 inclusion resource resource teachers, two per region, to work alongside our BITS to prepare our schools for twice exceptional students, for inclusion of students with disabilities in a proactive way, with the hope that eventually we'll need, we'll, those will help us reduce the need for BITS, but working alongside to have both proactive and reactive support. The other budget amendment I'd like to put in place is to have a budget amendment for a comprehensive review of our special education department. I believe. In, is that not a budget amendment? Okay, well, I can, I can withdraw that, but I would like to have a budget amendment to look at um, adding the inclusion resource teachers and 10 of those to see if we can at least start putting some proactive supports in for our um, special education department, especially our twice exceptional students. Um, just a little bit of history in my 42 section, seconds. Our high incidence disabilities team that really works on supporting curriculum and our um, students, especially in our general education settings, we have three specialists right now that support 65 schools each. And we have five curriculum resource teachers that support 40 schools. Our ABA coaches, we have 20 of them. Our ABA classrooms have increased nine classrooms per year, but we have not added ABA coaches for 10 years. So just some history from our special education department in terms of why I think we're seeing an increased need for behavior intervention because we don't have, I believe, sufficient resources for proactive support. Thank you, Ms. Seismer Heiser. Um, Chairman Corbett Sanders, I wanted to just get a clarification with you before we move to the next um, board member. Um, if Ms. Seismer Heiser uh, wanted 
or, or another board member wanted to sponsor an amendment uh, saying that they wanted this, this budget to um, have within it funding to do a comprehensive review or an external review of the special education services in Fairfax County Schools. I don't believe it would require necessarily a forum to have it vote on the budget. They could use, the forum could be used as a way to fleshing out the board's expectations, correct? Um, I think what the reason I mentioned that is because the forum has been, the issue has been on the, uh, on the agenda since December, and it's really part of the concept of putting it on the work plan of the Auditor General and um, having it done as an independent audit um, with an external consultant. And that's why I think that there, before you put that money in there, I think you might want to talk to the maker of the forum motion, or the maker of the forum to get more details on what's already in the works, and that's why I mentioned just, you know, so that so, we so tie perhaps, things together. Yeah, so perhaps one option, because again, this is going to be the advertised budget, not the adopted budget, perhaps then um, I, I would recommend uh, those board members consider a follow-on motion, um, because that, it, I think it's important to signify to the public, we want to engage the public between now and May on this in, important consideration of the board, and I think there's a lot of support from it from the board, so that wouldn't necessarily require a dollar amount to change the, uh, the advertised budget, but it would have with intentionality to direct both the superintendent and the board between now and May. But I think it's, it's almost a, it, it's doing it twice, because you've got the forum topic that is defining that that's what we're doing and signaling to the public, and then doing a follow-on motion on something that we're signaling to the public. That's the only reason I would say, why don't you maybe tie things together somehow, but it, it seems like we're not. Um, well, I, I think it's because there's one is an operational component and the other one is a budget component. And we can talk offline further, but I will just say to my colleagues, the value of doing even a follow-on motion is the special education community has been asking for us to take this seriously for a long time. If they see it in the advertised budget, the board supervisors and the public will know with intentionality that we plan to have something more permanently there by the adopted budget in May. Not having it there at all means we can continue to talk about it, but they may feel that it's seeing is believing. I like the idea of the board communicating that we want to see something done by May, and there will be a money, a, a financial component to it. I just think it speaks well to have it in the budget. Well, but. then I would just suggest that they tie those two together is all I'm suggesting, since Absolutely. we have um, somebody who has been advocating for this since December to make sure that we get that together, tied together. Yeah. The other piece, though, if I can, since you engaged me as the chair, I will, um, I think it's important for this board to understand that the, um, when we're looking at adding things to this budget, we should also be looking at taking things away then, because what we are ta signaling to the Board of Supervisors is what is the ask we're expecting the board to actually allocate to us. And so um, I know it's really exciting and important for us to express all of the things that are important for us to, that we value. and. Um, and that's really the role of this board is to give that guidance to the superintendent on what we value in our budget. But I also think that we have to be pragmatic uh, about expectations and some of the signaling that we've had. So we're going to have a conversation between the Board of Supervisors and the school board on Monday as part of the retreat on the budget. But I just think that we should um, take that into account when we're looking at what we're asking for. I, I appreciate that, Ms. Corbett Sanders, but uh, in talking to other board members and what we've done in the past, I think uh, the concern with that is we don't want uh, the bo individual board members to start reaching in the budget and randomly pulling things out. Fortunately, Dr. Braybrand, for two years in a row now, this is the second year, he has the $6 million placeholder that says, what are some of the other strategic initiatives that the board may want to consider? That six million alone is where people can start to identify these are areas of interest that we want to have considered, but it's not necessarily increasing the ask 
for for the over if we're going with still the 3.2 billion it doesn't necessarily have to change the bottom line of what we send over and that's the clarity that i was asking for because if, if what you're saying is we're working within that 6 million to talk about um, you know well, as I just said, yeah, but to be fair, as I said earlier, it's not the $6 million. And, and Dr. Bray Brandon, and I've talked about this. It is a $3.2 billion budget. And no, we don't have time right now to go digging around and questioning whether there's $20 million right now targeted the way he's proposing it, but where the board may ask more questions and decide we're going to reallocate the funds differently. That's the, that's the responsibility of the 12 board members. So. I, I think the biggest thing that we talked about earlier is, are we in agreement that the 4.2% is reasonable? And that will stay that way. I'm not hearing anybody wanting to increase the 4.2%. Um, and I certainly want to let everybody else start speaking to that. So um, so we have Ms. Bukarski, then Mr. Frisch, and then Ms. Omish. Thank you. I certainly do not want to increase it. Um, <laughs> just. Um, some questions. I am a, generally I support the addition and the reorganization of the departments. I see that when I've been talking to principals and individual teachers, the support they're getting um, from these people who are able to go in, help them, provide some of that professional development is, I think, really pushing um, student success forward, and that's what I want to see, and um, full support of that. Um, I would, I am it, in support of accelerating the IA pay. I'd like to get us there um, sooner than later. And I have to ask about FCPS on. It is such a large part of this uh, budget. Just to make sure I understood correctly, we're hovering around 50% of families that have paid the uh, student fee this year? Yeah, a little bit greater than that. Okay. Um, what is the plan? Do we know why people are not paying? Do they not know about it? It seems like the FCPS um, on evaluation from John Hopkins, there's a considerable number of parents who seem to not know that this is really going on, the one-to-one -one in schools. Um, can you speak to that? Any, anybody speak to that? Well, the invoices didn't go out until November. Uh, and so that may be why we haven't collected um, the full amount at this point in time. Um, but, you know, again, since the, the um, bills just recently went out, and then of course there was the holidays and that sort of thing, um, we're not concerned at this point. We do invoice through My School Bus, right. and there'll be a reminder invoice uh, that goes out, but I do not believe that has the second, rem the second uh, notice has gone out yet. Okay, um, just wondering. Um, uh, with FCPS on, uh, I know there's been some concern. Um, I personally fully support pushing down FCPS on to middle school. However, when I think we're going to take this budget to the Board of Supervisors, they're going to want to know, so how did it go at the high school? Um, so how did it go? I, I you know... I read the John Hopkins report. I see people's perceptions, people's ideas, the 20-minute observation in classes, um, and there's value in that. But how is this pushing student success forward? Where are the metrics? I did ask my kids to use a social media for some good, and I, I asked them to send out um, to their friends, hey, what do you guys think where we've gone one-to-one? -one? How's it going? And I have to say a lot of the responses were very thoughtful, but also very negative. We are, we're using, um, we see mismanagement, we see inconsistency, some teachers are using it amazingly, and I'm talking about the high schools right now. Um, some teachers are not using it at all. I had kids tell me they haven't taken their laptops out of their backpacks, which is concerning. Um, I see, other kids have said it's making a difference, it's helping me you know, do my homework. I'm really concerned about lessons learned, the professional development to make sure that this huge investment is going to equate to student achievement and student success. And uh, anybody who wants to take that? 
I can speak to the impact at the high school level and just kind of what we've seen. Um, at Oakton, we were one of the highest BYOD schools going into the FCPS on initiative. And the impact on instruction over the last several months has been incredible. Obviously, we have teachers at a bunch of varying different points in terms of their comfort level with technology. So for the, ever since my arrival there two years ago, so the year and a couple months before FCPS on, we were actively working to um, have the professional development in place. This school year, we have a uh, coaches corner where we have our instructional coach, our assessment coach, and our um, SBIT in one room together where teachers can go throughout the day and after school for assistance in various apps. Um, but I think the most powerful is just seeing um, and hearing back from my teachers and what we have seen is an increase in student voice. Obviously, we have kids that are very extroverted and always willing to participate in class, but we have many kids who are introverted and the fact that we have these devices in class has allowed an injection of student voice across the board through different discussion forums and different ways that they're using them in class. Um, I think many teachers are able to use them for small components of class, right? We don't wanna use them for 90 minutes, but we have this 15 minute activity that we're gonna do. And we've seen a lot of work in terms of stations where all right, this activity over here is gonna be with the computer and then we're gonna move on and throughout the, the different stations, there's different resources that kids are using. In terms of, um, it, we have access to the library resources in the classrooms. There's just so many things that our kids have been able to do. Um, in the hallways during remediation blocks, I see them making TikToks and all different things for their classes so that they're able to do these great assignments in school and collaborate and find that time during the school day. Um, so it's been a huge success from my perspective and what I'm seeing. I, I can add a uh, actual metric. So, um, to, we we asked our teachers to try one new thing because again, it's a tool, and and, and we, the last thing we want is kids sitting in front of a computer for 90 minutes. I mean, that's the last thing we want. So uh, we did a. It's a program called Pear Deck, and basically what it does is it attaches to your Google Slides, and so a teacher can take their Google Slides, and it becomes interactive, and. Uh, What's special about it is, is really three things in my mind. One, it has a social emotional component. Kids walk in the door and teachers can say, how are you feeling today? They have five faces that they can pick. Only the teacher sees that. So the teacher automatically right off the bat goes, okay, I got half my class is frowny face today, so what does that mean? And they engage the students. The other piece is you can go on a, a, um, a pace where the teacher has the, the pace of the uh, Google slide, and you can also allow the student to go self-paced on the Google slide. Uh, and then the, the piece that I think that was amazing for us is, so we, we modeled that as our, our breakout in our August session, and, our, and we modeled it for our teachers. There, I believe, 10 schools signed on, maybe a few more to the Pear Deck. Uh, and I asked my ESPITs to give us a number, and there's been an over a million engagements of Pear Deck. Uh, this year, I'm proud to say Hayfield's 10% of them, we have had 100,000 in separate engagements with the Pear Deck. So, and going back to what Jamie was saying, what the Pear Deck does is it allows students to engage and have their voices heard, because, and there's just a lot of different ways you do it. Some just the teacher can see, and then some that, that they come up and that they can see and interact with each other. So what we do find is a lot of our students that are quiet and reserved, but will type away, bang away on, on the computer, their voices are now being included and now being heard. But I mean, as an actual met metrics, we, uh, a million engagements, and that's just since, you know, the start of the first semester, so. And that's a brand new uh, tool that we've used. I'm so gonna just, jump. Just Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I wanted to speak to the uh, professional learning that's happening. Every school has a school-based technology specialist, and our job really is to coach the teachers, the ESPITs. Our job is to coach the teachers on how we plan engaging lessons that meet the needs of our students. So we oftentimes work one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, and we design these large school-wide professional learning opportunities. So all of those pieces are part of this. 
Um, additionally, the school-based technology specialist is a key member of the learning innovation team. We talked about that on the slide about preparation. That learning innovation team from every high school has been a key part of this. They gather for division-wide PD several times a year and then go back and lead the work with their colleagues in the school. They are the models of practice in the classroom um, and are oftentimes inviting other teachers into their class to see how it's going and then offer to help them plan. So we've got lots of supports in place in our classrooms and our schools to help teachers grow and take that next step wherever they are, whether they're very advanced or ready to take the first step. Well, and I just wanted to follow up on that, um, Stella. Thanks for asking that question because um, at Rocky Run, we're in our fourth year of implementation of FCPS on. So what you're asking about is extremely valuable. For the high schools being in their first year, um, we often, as principals, say to our teachers when we teach them something new or when we roll out something new, just try one thing. Just try one small thing and work with it and continue to learn. We're going to support you. Well, in four years of implementation, I can honestly say that in my 23 years in education, I have not seen anything as transformative as having laptops in students' and teachers' hands every day. And part of that is reciprocal learning because our students are teaching our teachers as much as our teachers are sharing content with them. It is very much an integrative and collaborative partnership of learning. Every classroom's different, you know that. I know that when I walk into different classrooms and different teams, and I want those classrooms to be different. We all do. But it's a learning process. So it takes more than a semester, a year, and our support staff is there to help us. So thank you for asking that. And just real briefly, I do want to just go back to the uh, Johns Hopkins evaluation reports because they are dense, um, and there's a lot to really try to unpack there. Um, and for our new board members, um, just please know that Johns Hopkins every year comes and does a work session with the board at the board's request um, where they unpack the evaluation findings. Um, they're also very willing to take questions that you might have right now as you're thinking about the budget in terms of their evaluation findings. But the evaluation itself is set up around the measurement of success in increased access to portrait of a graduate learning opportunities, so the types of experiences um, that our school-based leaders were talking about in terms of changing instruction. And those metrics, those survey results, are all key metrics that we've used to track the performance over time, and we're in year four of the evaluation report. So if you have questions um, that you'd like to pose to Johns Hopkins, I can facilitate getting answers on those for you as well. I know I'm almost done. I want to say thank you to all the school leaders for being here, but I also still want to know what were the hurdles this year in high school implementation? What are we going to do differently for middle school so that we're successful? Thank you. And I would actually welcome that commentary before we move to the next board member. I was just, I'm Margaret okay. Barnes, I'm from Holmes Middle School. I wanted to mention just the time that we have had to prepare for FCPS on has been a real advantage for middle school. We are excited and ready and have been for three years for this to come and have been watching our colleagues like um, Amy and Sharon over at Franklin and, and Rocky Run. Um, just as some examples, some of the things, we knew how different this would be for our teachers. So one of the first things that we did was, um, have a deeper understanding of who the middle school child is. You know, our middle schoolers, they need to be, and most of our kids, they need to be up and they need to be moving and they need to be collaborating and discussing. And how can we use technology to facilitate that, but also understanding that it's just one tool of many. The teacher, the laptop does not replace the teacher. Um, we've worked very hard on digital citizenship. Um, we're, many of our schools are common sense media schools because of the collaboration that we've done with parents, the work that we've done with students, and the professional learning we've provided to teachers. And the last piece that I would add is just, in addition to the professional learning, I feel very strongly about my responsibility to, to hold those teachers accountable because, and hold myself accountable because it, Whenever uh, we provide professional learning, we want to kind of see the return on the investment. You know, so if I see, you know, 90 minutes of instruction with students in front of screens, it's my responsibility to provide that feedback and follow up. If I ha hear from a parent that a student has never opened their laptop, it's my responsibility to follow up with those teachers um, to see how we could use that for, as a tool for engagement. So, so, to, so to go to challenges. Um, 
it is, I, I find that, that these words are odd coming out of my mouth. There were really no challenges. And for the, the board members that had been here and, and some of the staff, trust me, I have a reputation of letting people know when things aren't going well. And I, I say that um, because we, we had concerns. Here were our concerns. Our concerns were theft, okay? Our concerns were theft. Our concerns were uh, efficiency of getting computers out. Our concerns were kids not having chargers and, and then them not being charged. Um, our concerns were kids leaving them at home and then they show up and there's no computer. Um, we have virtually had none of that. And um, the, uh, fr from the get-go, the distribution went very, very well. We did it over the summer. The, uh, we had all but uh, 2,100 students. We all had maybe 300 that we had to give out what, the first week of school, which we were able to do pretty quickly, pretty easily. Um, we, we, uh, now, I'm knock wood, I hope I'm not jinxing myself, but we have had really no theft uh, of the computers. Um, and we've really, the kids are bringing them charged. I will say, always any new initiative, though, if we're asking teachers to do one new thing, there are some that aren't going to want to do one new thing. You know, there's, I've, I've, I've had this test for 30 years, and I give it on the fifth week of the school year. And so that's a fight we fight, though, and that's a fight with anything. You know, we're going to make sure that we, we try to have that differentiation. Um, our biggest, at my, my biggest concern at, at a secondary school is my middle school teachers feel alienated from their high school peers uh, because they cannot count on the technology every day because the carts don't always work. And so our biggest challenge has been for our students that are accessing high school classes, our middle school students who are accessing high school classes to be able to be able to walk both those. And I would just add really quickly, we have seen very few hurdles as well. And it, we were, I was thinking, oh my goodness, I'm handing out over 2,700 laptops on day one of school, which is what we did. We did it on the first day of school. And we were able to get every laptop to the classrooms the week before. We handed them out, and within the first two days, we had 98% of our laptops handed out to all the students. I think our lesson learned was that we are going to, we did it during our advisory time that day, so we had all 2,730 students logging on for the first time, which probably wasn't the best idea on our behalf, so we're going to span it out and do it during first block and say, okay, if you're ninth graders, you're from 810 to 840, and then our 10th graders, we want you guys to do it at this time to try to just span out that initial log on so that we don't overload the system, um, but in general, um, it's been very, very smooth, and I can't really speak to anything more than that, but we're, we're thinking about our rollout for next year and just small tweaks that we can make to that. I will add that I was part of the pilot in the Chantilly Pyramid. I was the Espas at Chantilly when we started that, and I will say that the the lessons we learned in the Chantilly Pyramid and the e-learning backpack schools are why this has gone so well. We learned some of the bumps, Amy and I have been through them, that maybe distribution during the summer doesn't work in every school. Maybe that first day, that grew out of a need in the pilot schools. Because we did pilot it for so many years and we're on year four, we learned a lot of those lessons and buffed out the shine there so that when it went to the high schools, we were ready. Um, and that doesn't mean that everything we chose to do in the school, I was talking with the T-Specs at my school today, and summer distribution wasn't as smooth as we had hoped. So we're looking at how do we do it differently. We're going to look at the model of putting them in classrooms and logging in the first period and spreading it out over the days. So what we have is a lot of different lessons from the first few years um, that have really been able to smooth out the bumps. At Lanier, if I could just add one thing that was a positive that we weren't really anticipating with our rollout was it was in conjunction with the way for the day. And our parents have been extremely happy that we don't have the devices out and all of the things that that can bring with it, that students are able to get on one platform. 
And um, also one other thing, our, um, our parent liaison who works with our Spanish-speaking families did an activity last year where she brought them all in for a question and answer session, our incoming seventh grade parents. And when they found out their children were going to get devices, we had parents who were actually tearing up because they had no device at their home for their children. And so bringing them home was very powerful for their family to have that online access. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for your uh, helpful input. I have uh, Carl Frisch followed by Ms. Omesh and then Ms. Marin. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'll just say that um, I think uh, I may speak for others on the board, but the disappointment in having to play with this, you know, couple hundred million dollars, this 4% increase juxtaposed, to, you know, not next to anything um, to weigh it against, you know. We're talking about a $3.2 billion budget and we're seeing 0.2. Um, and so when I think about what I'd like to put more money into, the only numbers that I'm looking at from what I can pull it from are other things that are new spending. Um, that's a problem for me. Um, so um, I would like to see in future budget uh, conversations that we start from a point of having the program budget um, so that we can actually have informed discussions about the money that we're spending. Um, uh, I'd also, so on the IA pay gap, um, great, uh, I, I support amending to uh, get us the full third step on the IA pay, um, and we'd still be $20,000 off from a living wage. So I'd support also adding a plan for getting them there so that they can actually afford to live here, maybe have a family and medical coverage too. Um, I would also support an amendment of $900,000 uh, additional for the uh, substance abuse prevention uh, specialists so that we can expand to every pyramid early. Um, and now, FCPS on, really quickly, I just want everybody out there to know that you're not talking to people up here who are opposed to technology. It is as if you're trying to sell us on the novelty of computers and the fun things they can do. Um, the survey questions, let me just read one. FCPS on supports the use of a broad array of instructional strategies to support my students' learning. A bunch of people said yes and some people said no. That tells me nothing about the implementation of the program. Um, in fact, um, one way that we could measure that is by having tracking software on these devices so that we know how they're being used. But we don't have that. Thankfully, if they're stolen or lost, we can find them, but we can't tell how they're being used. We don't know if they're being used more for Netflix or Microsoft Word or the app that was discussed. It says a lot that all of the questions about what were we worried about about FCPS on was could we get the computer into a child's hands and not could we have them use it or could we have educators use it. So when we talk about wanting to know what are the best practices, tell us how we are going to measure, not just anecdotal, all the stories we've shared about people having problems with FCPS on are just as anecdotal as the great things being said about FCP, FCPS on. Tell us something of merit and substance that shows that we are taking this seriously and that we're not just spending another $20 million with no evidence of support. Thank you. It's Thank you, Mr. Mr. Frisch. Uh, I have Ms. Omish, Ms. Marin. Uh, Ms. Kovax, did you want us to add you to the list? Okay. We, uh, it's not working. I think that the um, bulb must be out. No, so. she's under me. I was going to say. Okay, we're good. Okay. Are we good to go? All right, uh, first of all, thank you guys. Obviously, um, it's, it takes a lot of great effort to put this together. Um, I'm, I wanna think a little bit big picture here. I know, you know over the past work session and whatnot, we've been discussing the nitty gritty of, of programs that we wanna see in and out. Um, two hopefully really important points. The first is, um, I think I, I still, before supporting a budget, uh, would really love to see um, some thought given into, again, as we were saying, cost cutting, you know, what our assessments of efficiency and whatnot are based on programs we've tried in the past, where we are with them, whether they were effective, what um, moving forward we can look into, especially before a board of pre supervisors presentation on the budget, given that at least, you know, from our experience outside of being on this side of things, that that's been a point of tension or concern or 
uh, anxiety in, in granting us more uh, funding. So that's a really important piece to me. I mean, I think about, you know, uh, I was just looking at some big big budget items, right? So we have, of course, the, the I, and I mentioned this in my two by two, the, the health insurance piece, which is increasing. We know that the policy changes are leading us in a direction where that's gonna continue to increase. Um, but have we thought, I mean, on, you know, going back 10 steps, have we thought of potentially looking at how we can really penny pinch when it comes to that kind of stuff? We've probably, you know, uh, and, and, I, and I may be misinformed here, but, um, perhaps maintaining the same programs year after year. Uh, I know there are a lot of different avenues that the tech sector has really opened up, alternatives in healthcare and whatnot, where we can provide the same level, perhaps even better service, but at lower cost. I think those, that's just an example, right? I saw something marked for centralized instructional resources uh, for uh, over nine million, right? So there's a question for me there. We, we're saying we're not using textbooks. The commentary I see there says that it's for textbooks. I don't know, is there overlap, is there inconsistency? Perhaps there's room for cost cutting. Those are areas that I think are worth investing time into looking at, just to be fiscally responsible, to know that, you know, when we come to the Board of Supervisors present a budget, not only are we gonna ask for the amount we wanna ask for, um, but show them that we've done our due diligence, we've looked at the past five years, the programs that have worked and haven't, and, and done our cuts where they need to be. Certainly not to reduce quality, not to reduce you know, what we offer, but uh, perhaps things that just haven't worked. Uh, so so I, I mentioned that again and really want to emphasize it. The second piece here is thinking big picture and, and with a zero-based kind of mentality that I'm coming with here. Um, I, I, I want to understand from my colleagues, from you know, the chair, from everyone here, why are we not envisioning what our ideal budget would be to be at best practice levels with everything? And, and who knows, maybe that number will be six billion. But, and presenting what we are requesting to have the excellent school system that we want, f fully expecting that we may be receiving less than half of that. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, when we look at a million things, we're talking about uh, best practices in terms of getting our ratios up to par with psychologists, social workers, parent liaisons. We've talked about, um, you know, there's healthy food, there's facilities adjustments, uh, you know, disability and implicit bias PD, restorative justice, sustainability, trauma-informed practices, healthy food, you know, 2E support, um, socio-emotional development and learning, all of these things, that, that, and we know our staff are overwhelmed, we're paying IAs and whatnot below par or poverty level salaries. Why can we not envision a budget that puts all of these needs where we can have a school system that, that, you know, and sure there are bonuses here and there, but being realistic and reasonable at best practice level, and the Board of Supervisors can grant us what they're able to grant us of that, and then we make decisions accordingly. Thank but you I don't so know that much, we're even Ms. projecting Amish. what we need. Yep, I'm happy to have you on the, the go back list. Um, Ms. Marin, followed by Ms. Darnet Kofax, and then I have Dr. Anderson and myself. So I'm really glad to have this opportunity to talk with my colleagues because it's been so hard for us to be able to do that from the restricted, you know, restrictions that we have. And um, I, I can't stress enough how, how much I need this in order to hear what you all think and make informed decisions. And I agree with the, the sentiment that Ms. Omesh is saying. I agree with what Mr. Frisch is saying about the analysis. And what I wanted, wanted, have been wanting to share with you all is to also think big, but it's, you know, what are the quality investments that we're looking for? Um, I think when we've spoken individually, we talk about what our priorities are. And, and for me, I'm gonna say my biggest priority is easing the overwhelm on our teachers because when they do their job better, our students will learn better and, and grow better. And so what does that mean? You know, I'm not sure. I don't know how we get more planning time. I don't know if we need to hire more subs, but I'd like to entrust our staff to come up with those solutions. But I think, you know, I, I'm always cognizant of how many directives are we keying up and asking staff to go for. Well, if, how do we get to some consensus to say, look, this is the big thing, or like the list of big things. Um, you know, the, the special education needs, that's also a, a huge priority for me because I think it impacts not only our special needs students, but the entire school community. Um, the workforce piece, we've heard it in many different ways. Um, we heard it at the public comments the other night. Students want career-based education. They want the sustainability ed. I don't see anything in here about growing get to green or sustainability or green economy education. So where, you know, I agree with what has been said about how do we think big and think within our 
within our means, but in some way aren't we the ones that's supposed to set that, you know, let's shoot for the stars in some way and then see what we can really do. But we can't have it all. And I think evaluating what our programs do well and making decisions about what doesn't serve us and taking them off the table at this point in time is really needed. So I agree with what's been said about getting those evaluations for what's been working. And um, we can't be a mile wide and an inch deep. We have to have quality. So um, I will say just on another note, um, there was something mentioned, this is a little side note, about the bathroom issue at McLean. Like I know we have bathroom issues at South Lake High School on the field. I mean, there's two porta potties for an entire field for a high school event, and other schools grapple with these things. So, you know, like that's one thing that I just want to point out. Like there are these little things that happen too, but how do we roll that all in to, um, is that, you know, a budget decision? Is it a sidebar conversation? You know, this is a, a process question, but again, let's keep our eyes on the prize, whatever we define that as, and go for the quality and not get bogged down with, you know, tinkering at the sides. We're here because we want quality. Thank you, Ms. Marin. I have uh, Ms. Kovacs. Thank you, and um, thank you to staff for your presentation tonight, and thank you for the principals for being here tonight. I do appreciate that. Um, uh, for my colleagues, just so you know what I'm thinking, um, I would like um, maybe at a next work session a more in-depth um, analysis of what the changes are in the Office of School Support and Expansion. Um, I need to understand that better. It's not so much the two positions, but the, the rationale for bringing that together and how that happened. And um, I, and a lot of my things that I'm talking about probably will fall under that. So um, I, I also just want to see, um, you know, I've been a big advocate for the change in curriculum for our English language learners, particularly the level one and level twos. And, I, and there's not a lot of detail in this budget um, as to what additional programming offers might come into play or needed or um, what the success has been of where we are currently. Um, because um, for my colleagues who knew to the board, this was a pilot program that was started in um, Lee and what back then was Stewart, now Justice, and um, then it rolled out into additional high schools and it's um, intensive curriculum support and differentiated curriculum for our um, English language learners. And so those numbers continue to grow, the level ones and level twos. So I'd like to know what we're doing there and you know, maybe looking and thinking that Office of Support and expand, uh, School Support would be where those monies would be. Um, last year, the Title I bar was raised and um, <coughs> You know, I know we some schools grandfathered in. I'm starting to hear some rumblings um, in my area about uh, if they're no longer going to be um, grandfathered in this year, the changes that will happen, and I think that's important. Um, if uh, the Title I funds aren't there, do we need to talk about additional change in needs-based staffing or some kind of supplement to that? Um, I'll, I'll be interested in looking at that as we go through the, through the process. Um, the, um, I, I, th I know there's a million dollars and we're waiting on the AAP report, but there are two things that have talked about um, that, that prove effective and our consultant did allude to this. I have no idea if he will make that, that team will make the recommendations, but um, MSAOC as well as um, the APAC committee for years have been talking about advanced academic resource teachers in the schools to allow access and um, a solidifying of the Young Scholars Program. So that's something that I'm looking at. And at this point in time, um, I would um, continue to support FCPS on, based upon um, the knowledge that I have from last year, what I'm continuing to hear. Again, I've discussed this with some of my colleagues. I have not heard some of the um, troubles. I, again, um, and my region is very diverse. It's not just um, the access, um, although that played a big part in my region. Um, 
children needing to have access to this programming via one-to-one uh, uh, -one access, but also flexibility and opportunity, and I'm hearing positive there. So I'll continue to, talk. I'd love to have, continue to have dialogue where concerns. Thank you, Ms. Cosbacks. And I think we need to continue to ask staff to continue to answer our questions where we have concerns. Wonderful, I really appreciate that. Um, I have uh, now um, Dr. Anderson, then myself, and then what we're gonna do is, uh, for the next round of go-backs, we're just going to start from the, um, the the lineup again, and you can just let us know whether you want to take your go-back or not. So you could turn off your lights. Um, thank you so much. You know, this is not a, an easy process. You know, we're kind of caught in the caught in the weeds here, but yet we want the opportunity to kind of step back and think big picture and evaluate where our priorities are. So I understand the challenges. I appreciate the challenges. I wish it wasn't so, but I. I just having the conversation, I think, helps us maybe to move a little bit towards that uh, middle ground. Having said that, I'm going to get in the weeds here a little bit, um, starting with FCPS on. You know, I've had the opportunity in my professional life to see this at work, and when it is happening, it is fabulous in terms of how this tool it is a tool, it is not a means to an end. It is a tool that is going to help to enhance what is happening in the classroom. Um, I worry a little bit when we try to evaluate um, the measure of that tool because it's hard to decouple it from all of the other things that are happening. Unless we're teaching typing, it's hard to determine exactly what it's going to look like. But when we have that coupled with engaging, oops, too engaging, engaging classroom activities, you get this wonderful dynamic which really gets kids to have access to information that they may not have otherwise. And in speaking in Mason District, particularly for me here, it is a matter of equity because we have students who will never have the opportunity to complete an assignment at home because it's just not possible. So if we're really talking in terms of one Fairfax, for me this is almost a no-brainer. Having said that, I do know that there's some work to be done. And Ms. Barnes, I do appreciate what you've shared because you pretty much ticked off two things on my list. Um, accountability, it has to be up to the school leaders to make sure that we're holding teachers accountable to the implementation and the matter that's intended. But however, we have to provide our teachers with the professional development to be able to do that, to do that um, um, effectively. Um, my specific question is, I noticed on the survey you had a number of teachers, parents, and students that were surveyed on the slide that was shared earlier. Is, does this include all of the schools or a portion of the schools that have um, the FCPS on at this point? This includes the phase one schools, so those encompass those six original high schools, um, and then the Chantilly Pyramid schools and Lanier Middle School as well, and that's on the footnote down at the bottom of the uh, oh. slide 16. Sorry, I think I missed no, no, that. Yeah, of course. What specific concerns have you um, been able to raise from that survey? Because I didn't see it. I saw some um, information, and again, it's a very deep survey. Um, you probably have spent much more time with it than I have. Um, what specific parent concerns were raised, either through the survey or through your work with parents as you've engaged in this? What have you heard? So I'd like to have both the um, Johns Hopkins information and then some brief anecdotal in, um, information from some of the principals. So I, I think, you know, from the parent perspective, the parents have been quite supportive of the initiative, and that's the survey results that we shared. I, I think you see pretty high levels of understanding of the need for technology um, and support for the use of technology. I think the main concern we hear from parents, not just in the survey results, but when we've engaged the PTA associations, when we've done community meetings, is they want to make sure that their kids are not on screens all day long, okay. right? Um, it's really difficult because it's kind of the cumulative effect of technology. Um, students that have cell phones or play video games at home, you know, they're worried about then, are they going to be on screens all, all the time during the instructional day as well, right? So one of the things that we've really worked on is that media balance guidelines um, kit that we've developed um, where we have strategies and resources and that's part of our professional development work that we do with teachers is about helping them understand when to use technology when it's appropriate to use it as a tool, and other times when maybe it's more appropriate not to use it and to use more traditional methods, because it is really important to parents, and it's important to me as a parent, um, I've got two kids in FCPS, that kids are not on screens all the time. So I would say that's the main concern that we've heard from parents. 
and I'd let principals add to Just that. Just to follow up on that, I would agree with um, Dr. Presidio. So um, we do hear from parents that there are concerns that students might be sitting in front of computers all day doing all their work on computers. Um, that maybe, how do we set limits as families at night? How do we work in the community, you know, um, to make sure that um, we know what our students are doing on the computers when they're bringing them at home, you know, bringing them home? Are they working on schoolwork or are they watching Netflix? Mm -hmm. Are they staying up till all hours? So it's, a, it's really a, a partnership between families and the school to make sure that we're working together to set limits and be really clear. I can share that in the Chantilly Pyramid, we've worked um, on large-scale community events where we work as a pyramid, K through 12, um, to engage families. Um, for example, last spring, all of our schools participated in um, a community event in which families were welcome to come in and engage with our students and with our teachers to see what's happening in classrooms and talk to our students and talk um, and raise questions sure. and share concerns. We've also done our individual schools, PTA-sponsored events, um, our school in particular, mm -hmm. screened um, screen aid and talked and had an open dialogue about that and concerns. We work individually at each school, and I'm sure I speak for my colleagues when I say that if a parent raises a concern and says, my child is using his or her laptop until the wee hours of the morning, why is that happening? Then we engage in that partnership and say, well, this is why that should not be happening, and here's how we can work with you. And maybe we do need to limit your child's access to that laptop at home. I do have parents who have said, you know, I'd, I'd prefer my child to only have it on certain days or not take it home every day. One thing we are working on um, as well is inviting parents into the classroom to see what's happening. For two years, um, at my school as well as at other schools in our pyramid, we've had family learning walks where we invite families to come in on certain days and walk the building to see what's happening with instruction. It's, it's hard to really explain it without seeing it in action. And I think your concerns are very valid, but we have to engage our families in this dialogue to make sure we're all on the same page. Do we have opportunities or have any families um, chosen to opt out? Or if a family says, I really don't want my child to engage in this, do they have the option of opting out? So they can opt out of the device. I'm sorry, I probably jumped in here. They can opt out of having the device issued to them or um, can only use it at school. They can't opt out of using technology as right. a tool for instruction, right. if that makes sense. So, you know, when you're, as any other tool we'd want to provide students access to during the school day, um, we want to make sure they have access to the technology they need for their learning activities. But yes, but the opt out, and I'm sure that they have statistics on this, is, is very, very minimal. Okay. 277 out of 60,000. Thank you. Um, this next question is for Lee. The leases, um, I think it was slide 28. Uh, Dr. Anderson, oh. your time is up, but if you want to just seconds. ask the quick question, because you're- I have two <laughs> seconds. No, the, it stops at two seconds and then stays at two seconds. I know. <laughs> I know, it was gonna be a two second question. You, you, you go ahead, shoot it in, go. Oh. Are the leases continuing after the five years that you projected, the 4.8, 4.0 million? Is that a continuing um, yes. budget item? Uh, yes, in the sense that um, you will have to refresh and begin a new lease for the next five years. Well, no, I mean, it'll depend on the interest rate. It'll depend on the enrollment the because we, okay. we budget for or we what we leased is for about 60,000, which represents loaners, a 5% for loaners. Plus, we assumed an enro a slight enrollment increase across the four years in the current phase. And so depending on the interest rate, depending on the number we purchase, which is based on enrollment, all of those things um, would determine the amount and then the annual payment to the lease. Great, thank you. Uh, I will uh, go ahead and take my turn and then uh, just uh, with a quick show of hands, how many board members would like to take a five minute break since we've been going for a little over two hours? Okay, we'll, after I um, make my remarks, we'll take a five minute break and come back and do another round of, um, of comments. <laughs> Excellent, you can go ahead, uh, start the clock. So uh, I, I wanna first uh, thank um, Ms. Cohen and Mr. Frisch um, and other colleagues as well. I guess Ms. Pekarski, you actually were kind of the driving force um, on the comments about FCPS. I, I really do appreciate all of our educators being here and, and uh, truly speaking passionately about what we know is important. Um, technology is a tool and we do know that 21st education requires it. 
Uh, my concern as one of the veteran board members who's been engaged in this conversation from the very beginning, starting with Dr. Garza, is that um, there seems to be a disconnect in when the board speaks and what the superintendent and the administration are hearing. No one that I've ever heard is against technology in the classroom. We all embrace it as a tool, and I want our children to be successful. Where our parents are taking a pause, and it starts from those um, presentations where we did listening tours around the, the county, which weren't listening tours, people felt they were infomercials. When we start talking to either board members or to the public about teachers or facilitators, it's gonna be individualized, student-centered learning. Um, there are things where you start to describe this as they're sitting in an online classroom. And I don't think anybody means for that to happen, and certainly not tonight. I think all the principals have done an outstanding job talking about the value. But at a very macro level, I just I really felt it was important to emphasize here. I don't think the board wants to extract this from the budget next week, but I will be talking to my colleagues that I am looking at some sort of follow-on motion to help the superintendent, to help the administration, to help our principals understand that there is going to be continued examination of this before everyone thinks there's a green light to do this um, for the school year of um, fall 20. I, I think that the questions have been asked are important. I think the public needs to um, feel more comfortable with it. I feel that there's been questions that just aren't being um, really addressed effectively. Um, we know, for example, from the research that writing mm -hmm. pen in hand is how things get embedded into the brain. And, um, and I'm not saying that's not happening in our in our one-to-one -one schools. It's just understand that almost in the effort to make sure we understand the value out of getting this to the middle schools and the excitement and the energy, it almost takes on the sense that the only way these kids are learning is they're going in and this laptop has to be there, not just in the classroom, but it's gotta be with them when, they t when they're at home and anything less than that and these kids aren't gonna be successful. And all three of my boys didn't have this at all and were highly successful at some of the best universities in the country. So I just want us to kind of be mindful in how we talk about this. So now that my time is up, everybody gets to go on a five minute break and we'll be back for another round.
can't even get Ikea. I was looking for something for work. <laughs>
Colleagues, we have seven at the table. We'll go ahead and get started. The rest of my colleagues, we are looking forward to seeing your smiley, happy faces. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, first, I would like my colleagues to know that I believe that I that we can. Oh, my colleagues to know that um, I am comfortable with the top line of this budget because of the guidance that we received last year from the uh, Board of Supervisors and what we've continued to hear. Um, I do think, and I am pleased that my colleagues on the board are um, as thirsty as I am for a more detailed um, pr uh, presentation of the budget and the linkage of the budget at that level of detail to our strategic plan because uh, it really is something that is perhaps the uh, second most important task that this board has, which is, you know, first hiring the superintendent and then ensuring that we have a well-managed system and that is how we do our budget allocations. It is critical that our budget allocations reflect our values. And that means that it has to fairly um, support the needs and be student focused. And it's not just one category of students, but all categories of students. And it's not only students at a general ed level or an advanced academics level or a special ed level, it is all students. And it's also the continuum to include from early childhood all the way through to graduation, um, the possibility of obtaining career and workforce certifications and um, early college and dual enrollment and more. So I will join my colleagues in asking for that more robust linkage. And in, along those lines, a couple years ago, I understand that there was a task force that was established that um, looked at operational efficiencies at the um, program level. And I think that it's perhaps as part of our um, review of our budgeting and making sure that we are uh, spending most effectively and uh, focused on students, perhaps it's time to look at reconvening that. Um, I don't know uh, if that's something that would be done as a follow-on to this. And then the other is I do want to talk briefly about um, FCPS on and one aspect that I don't believe we talked about before, which is the challenge that we have in ensuring that our portrait of a graduate is realized for our students. And part of that is their ability to do primary research and at the upper levels. And primary research is facilitated through um, the digital world. And one of the things that this board has talked about multiple times is the cultural competency and um, looking at our text and our curriculum to ensure that we don't have biases. But one of the challenges we have okay, is our textbooks. I'll get off in two seconds. And, our, and by being able to come online, that's uh, one way of getting past that. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Dr. Brabrand, you wanted to speak? I didn't know if it was appropriate, but just because we had a break, could, could I just share, could I, could I have a minute maybe? Of course, you One can minute. have all three minutes. Could, you just could I have three minutes three hours, just to make you a get share three before minutes. we go back around? <laughs> In two seconds. Real quick, I really appreciate the passion that all the board members have brought tonight for this budget. And I try to think, part of my job is to put myself in your shoes. Many of you are brand new with a $3 billion budget, feel like you're only getting a piece. That's fair. That's fair feedback. That's maybe something I'm not really thinking about as well or as deeply as I need to. We really have a budget process that starts back in the beginning of the year. We already have some ideas, you know, in the fall where we do a mid-year budget review where we just get started. We could start to go through the program budget for that year and really lay out the detail to help set the stage for when the superintendent's budget comes in January and we can stop, we, we can better align and really have that conversation way earlier before the superintendent proposes the budget in January. 
What we're forced with now is many new people coming in trying to make major, major decisions. One other thing I just want to say is when we look at the budget, and I haven't got the numbers, we're going to go back and have staff look. A huge number, I don't have the percentage yet, is just formula driven. Positions based on class size, standards of quality, and then additional support positions we put in, like you talked about those inclusive teachers that became bits. And I want to figure out what that number is. The program piece is a much, much more smaller piece. And, and then that's where those hard decisions are. And, and then the um, two, up, two other things. How much time do I have left, uh, Dr. Anderson? Have a minute? The, the other, um, the other uh, two things I wanted to say. Let me tell you the biggest challenge to me, because that was one of the questions for the board. What's the biggest challenge with FCPS on? The biggest challenge with FCPS on is the biggest challenge with any initiative in Fairfax County Public Schools, fidelity of implementation. Great teachers doing it well, and great teachers do anything well, and teachers struggling with the tool, right? A $40 million tool over five years for a high school and $19 million for middle, but a tool nevertheless. And how well are they doing it in my child's classroom? I'm glad right, my boys have seven teachers, right? And in seven teachers, you may have variability of the implementation. Some of it could vary based on the content area, but we want everybody to be using it at high levels of implementation. And part of the goal really is what Dr. Presidio said, is accelerating Portrait of a Graduate. We can do Portrait of a Graduate without technology. There's no doubt that we can. But it is a tool that we believe can actually make teachers less overwhelmed. Differentiating in a class of 26 kids, 28 kids, is hard. Technology frees up teachers to be able to do more of that differentiation, grouping by gr reading level size, where and every kid's just got the same laptop. No one knows that you're in a different book than another. That's some of the power, um, and it's harder to metric that. But I get the power of metrics, and I believe in metrics, and I, I know we can work to better do that for you all. Um, and uh, finally, I just want to thank all the staff. You know, we're here to serve this board and help you make good decisions. Um, and uh, as Ms. McLaughlin said, and I really appreciate it, I recognize in so short of time to make big decisions. Um, but we do have some more time, even, even after next week, to dive in deeper and make sure you get the clarity of information you need um, to, make, um, to make good choices. So I appreciate those few minutes, and maybe I'll have a couple comments at the very end after another couple of rounds. But thank you so much for letting me have a, uh, a moment. Appreciate it. Dr. Braban, you're one of the team. We always want to make sure you have that, your voice as part of our work here. So don't hesitate. Um, I do just want to correct one thing. We are very blessed that we have technology in all of our classrooms already. It's how we enhance it and have greater access to it. But nowhere in Fairfax County is a child getting education without technology already. So um, with that, we now have um, Ms. Keith Gamara followed by Laura Jane Cohen and then Elaine Tolan. I, I'm, thank you. I, I'm really glad to go after you, Dr. Braybrand, because I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of the fundamental concern that I have and is driving all of my comments. And that is I'm highly concerned about equity um, but I, I do realize sitting on this side, I have, we have a fiduciary responsibility. And when we implemented Fair, uh, FCPS on, I was led to believe, or I at least had the impression, that we would have the evaluation that this board would tend to expect to know that we could address those fidelity issues. It has been disheartening to me to recognize that we have so many issues of fidelity to deal with across this county. And so my hope was that we would evaluate this first year in high school and what we have already done to try to build better and to make sure that we avoid the pitfalls that we know already ex exist in different areas of, my of the county. And so that really is fundamentally what is bothering me. Because when I do look at what John, the John Hopkins research shows me, it is, seems to be largely relying upon surveys. It is not providing metrics of any sort. 
um, I appreciated the comment uh, from Rocky Run Middle School about four years. I, you know, I have not had an opportunity to look at, to see if that has had impact on um, the achievement in that school. Um, I would love to look at that kind, those kinds of metrics because I know that it sometimes is hard to, to measure what an enhancement is, but if, you, if we've been doing things a certain way for so many years and we add something else, we should be able to see what, what differences that creates. And I do feel, based on my um, relationship with the community, that that is my duty as a board member. So I hope that everyone understands that that's where these questions are coming from. We fully support um, using technology, um, but we're just trying to figure out how to build better. So let me hurry up and get use my one minute, 43 seconds to get out the questions I have. Um, so the evaluations that we have, obviously, if they are relying on the surveys, I don't think that that is um, uh, sufficient. Um, d data regarding subject matter competence is really what I'm looking for. Um, Carl, you said it well. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> and I already talked about fidelity of implementation. So I, I, I want to have a conversation going forward on how we build better. I don't know if I get a come uh, my, uh, get a go back to talk about what it is I'm including in my um, um, amendments, but they are included in the draft that's been handed out. And so I'll have to rely on that because I have to respect that too over there. Thank you, Ms. Keith Gamara. Uh, Ms. Cohen, followed by Ms. Tolan, followed by Ms. Uh, Sizemore Heiser. I just want to echo too about FCPS on that my job is to represent the Springfield District, and it's to represent all of our students, all of our teachers, all of our families, but at the end of the day, I'm doing a disservice to my district when I have continued to hear time and time again, whether it was on the doors or whether it's the 45 emails I've gotten since this process has started from parents who are continuing to say, this is hurting my family at home. Not in school necessarily, not in the classroom, but having that laptop at home has been a huge issue. And I feel like that is not a voice that I have heard. It is not your responsibility necessarily to know what goes on at home. Your job, I understand, is to provide the best resources and provide the best tools, and that is what you are trying to do. And I know you are always trying to think of the whole child when you do that. So when you hear my frustration, when you hear Carl's frustration, my job is to speak for those people who this is happening at home and they may not know that they need to have those conversations with you. And so I will continue to push that. I, I am taking that as a personal note to say when I'm hearing, I want this to go to principals and they should know what is happening in your home because if they've been keeping that to themselves and not realizing that so many of them are struggling, which is sort of the power and the negative sometimes of social media as people make connections of like, oh my God, this is happening in my home too, maybe you are not hearing that. And so I feel a responsibility to be that voice. But point noted that I will ask them to contact principals as well so you do know what's going on at home. Um, I just want to quickly say I have a big concern, which I've already voiced, over this halftime special ed chair of 70 schools. I hate that the idea is that we're just going to use SPED enrollment. I, I'm like, I don't think that that really captures what is happening in our elementary schools if we're just using, like, even percentage of SPED students versus whole population. We're not looking at 504s, and that local screening does take time and resources. Um, and I, I am so afraid that when we choose those 70 schools, that we are going to be missing a lot of schools who have kids with very significant needs, but maybe don't have the numbers that some other schools do. So I will be putting forth a budget amendment that those halftime um, SPED shares go to all 142 elementary schools. Um, I pay, I keep beating the band over and over again, 
we got to figure out how to do better and we got to figure out how to get them to 30 quicker. So, thank you. Ms. Cohen, you actually have an extra minute from the time before if you want to speak to I have one of the So other many thing. more things to say. <laughs> um, so, um, one of my questions too, and this may be better to um, Dr. Brabrand or maybe ferret it out up the chain of um, folks who know more than I do, but why did you decide to choose the ADSA over like ISS personnel? You know, we made the change in SRNR, we have more kids in in school suspension. I'm hearing from my schools that they need more personnel um, because more kids in that, there wasn't necessarily bodies to actually be there, um, or security assistance. I, as a parent, get really scared when I hear that we do not have enough security assistance in our schools to make sure that every door is monitored as kids are coming in, that, you know, in the halls that we're really relying on our admins to be the ones to be hall monitors, which is really, at the end of the day, not what we want our administrators to be doing. So I have some concerns about, again, in our needs versus wants, I know we're making choices, but what made you choose ADSAs instead? One of the reasons I, uh, first of all, let me actually do the last one first. Safety and security in schools is huge, huge. We did our parent um, survey, first time we've ever done a division-wide parent survey, and we saw high numbers, I'd almost say almost 90% of folks, of students saying they felt safe in school. That's, that's good, that's still 10% of kids, right? There's room, but that is overall, even by the group, the firm that did it, uh, K-12 Insight, that is a high number for a school district, and we wanna keep that. We, we have a great OSS operation and security assistance support. Um, the ADSA, so we want to continue to have a focus on uh, safety and security in this board just two years ago, put in money for additional training to do the uh, tabletop, which is one of the real issues um, to make sure that our folks really know what to do when there is a crisis. Um, and that training is important. Training is important in all of the pieces. We've done the middle schools, adding cameras there to eight more middle schools to really help be an extra pair of eyes uh, when you, you can't have a security assistant for every, every door, every hallway. Um, and a lot of principals have really worked on best practices to have teachers out in the hallway during class change to be visible and be able to help redirect students if they need it. Um, but safety and security remains a prominent uh, issue for us, and we're going to continue to keep a focus on it. The reason we picked the ADSA, the reason I, and it's the superintendent's budget, we looked through the trades. This was something almost every high school traded for. Um, and so um, we wanted to deal with that. We know our extracurricular programs have grown really tremendously over the years, and it's been the same formula. Um, I do think there's room to do some additional work to support schools with their in-school discipline process. Um, two or three years ago, prior to my, three or four years ago prior to my arrival, Dr. Garza put in something called the SOSA at high school to really help provide some social emotional. So I felt like some support had been provided there. The ADSA, the extracurricular program, hadn't been looked at in a while. And I wanted to put a little bit more support in for that as I was also introducing this concept that the board had brought up last year of this equity fund to support extracurricular activities. So I wanted to really bring, pair both of those together, additional supports for the extracurricular program and a direct support to help kids. But it was a choice and, uh, and I certainly know that high school principals have made it clear, hey, Dr. Brabrand, that's nice, but we would really like to see more and particularly that IA that we often trade for for in-school suspension. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I now have um, Ms. Tolan, followed by Ms. Sizemore Heiser, and then Ms. Pekarski. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Cohen. Um, two of the items I'm continually hearing from my schools as well are um, concerned around security and support for the SOSAs, so I appreciate those um, comments. Um, the other things I'm hearing about are, um, that are in your budget are the on-time um, graduation coordinator and the, the substance abuse specialist as being um, very important. Um, I did want to um, talk about IA pay. I certainly um, support increasing their pay. I just had a question as to, I know that to be an IA, you only need to have two years of college, but 
I think I know personally a number of IAs are in that position that have graduate degrees or at least you know a um, you know bachelors, and they're doing incredible work on special projects you know in our schools. Um, it's Nixon. I don't do any school districts around. Do they? Is there any? You know, like the teachers have a scale for if you have a bachelor's, a scale for if you have a master's. Is there any way to do something like that? On the IA scale, is the I'm sorry. Is the question that if an IA an IA has a bachelor's degree, to, to pay them more? Right. Um, it's not um, part of the job description. It's not part of the requirement or the qualification currently. So they wouldn't necessarily get credit for that. I guess what I'm asking too, and this is, can be something we look at later, is that. A, a way we can look at being more fair to our IAs, or is and are other school districts doing anything like that? Um, yeah, so yeah. that might be something we could discuss later as part of this whole idea. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. It's something we could take a look at. One of the things I'd tell the board, and, and, and again, right, candid, that's what you want to hear and learn what my thinking is too, as an educator and, and being in the system for a long time, one of the things um, that the folks who mentored me as I came through the system said, where do we want the system to have the biggest reward and payoff at? And really it's been, and it has been for the last few years, the board priority, the payoff is in that, t I, I, again, I, we love everybody, we need to support our Fairfax family, but where should the scale be most powerful? And it needs to be in that teacher scale, right? And so we've really spent multiple years doing that. We've, we've put another hundred and I think $20 million in three years to enhance that teacher scale. Um, how much do you want? We have good retention for IAs. They do need to be paid more. I don't disagree. But do you want to incentivize that position so much that then people who have teaching credentials would choose to be an IA over being a teacher. Just, just a policy question to think about. Not that more support for them isn't necessary, but thinking about that in tandem with the teacher scale. Um, and traditionally, I would say this system has had a laser, well, it, years and years ago, it was a, it was a laser focus on teachers. I think we got away from it a little bit. We have caught back up and it's figuring out how to continue to maintain that teachers drive the quality of the classroom, which drives people to say, I want to put my child in that classroom in that school. And closely behind that is the quality of the principal leading those teachers in the school. Then we need an all-star support uh, staff. So it's really a relative thing, but it's one of those things as we even look at that IA scale, in contrast to the teacher, how much you want to incentivize it. Thank you. Um, also, one of the areas that you know we've talked about and I would like to continue conversations on is uh, workforce development. Um, Melanie brought that up also. And, and that, I think, it's looking at our bigger budget and where does that fit in. Um, I'm fully in support of the Trades for Tomorrow program, and um, but one thing I would like to look at is, and I'm, I don't have the exact numbers, I think we have eight students currently in that program, um, but we only have two um, apprentice positions. I mean, it would be really great if we, however many kids we have in that program, if we had positions that they could move into. Um, and I think we get, you know, double bang for our buck with that because, um, you know, also being on the audit committee, you know, our facilities folks are looking for, you know, additional entry level positions. So, you know, from the whole, for the students, the workforce development and for the facilities, you know, I'd like to see that, you know, those positions there. So something we can take a look at. Um, I do want to um, just voice my support for FCPS on. I was fortunate um, being in instructional services not that long ago to be in on some of the training courses for educators um, for FCPS on and I was looking at it in, from a science um, educator and a sustainability educator perspective and we were using um, blended learning 
you know, very successfully in those situations. And, um, I, and then hearing from my principals, the middle school principals are super excited about the um, away for the day with the phones and how they can use that um, with the computers. Um, Drainsville is an interesting district. We've got schools on both ends of the spectrum, and um, it's an equity question, you know, for a number of my schools to be able to have that, um, you know, one-to-one -one technology for all students. And um, I've just seen incredible instruction on those, uh, the Cooper Middle School, for example, that does have the computers, that's not the, the FCPS on, um, but they, you know, have computers for their students. Um, can I say one more thing? But I do want to discuss supports. If you want to ask the Thank quick you. question, slide Thank it you. in. Thank you. Oh, supports for? For uh, FCPS on, like okay. moving forward, like the, you know, if we do need additional PD or we need additional supports okay. for families. Okay. That's Thank you. Good, good points. Okay. Um, I have Ms. Seismer Heiser followed by Ms. Pokarski and then Mr. Frisch. All right, thank you. I have uh, several things. First, I'll, I'll start with where you left off with FCPS on. I will say that I, I am very torn about this. Um, I, I will reiterate that I firmly believe technology is beneficial for our students, and our students need technology to learn, so this is not about having not having technology for our students to learn. Um, I have heard both sides from families and constituents. I've heard some constituents, especially in some of our Title I schools, who, who really do love it and are, are really excited, and, and one whose uh, daughter can access a summer school program because she has a laptop she can keep for the summer. I've also heard many of the same things that Ms. Cohen has heard about concerns about the laptops at home and monitoring. And I heard somebody here say, we work in a parent part, and I apologize, I don't remember which one it was, it said we work with a parent partnership and, and how do you, that's great, but I also hear parents say I'm tired and I don't, I don't want to police my children on one more thing. And I've heard that, and again, like what Ms. Cohen said, I do feel like it is part of our job to sort of hear these things and, and encourage them to reach out. Um, the survey, I do have some concerns on the, the questions, and I don't know if there's other survey questions, but these seem very broad. For example, without a computer, it would be difficult to be successful in school. Well, that's true. I mean, I, I think it'd be hard to say no to that. So I'm not sure if, if the questions got to really the meat of what I think I'm hearing and the concerns. That's just a, a comment I have. Um, and do we have tools to help parents become better partners? And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Google Classroom. When my children started in the schools, everything was on Blackboard, and parents had access to Blackboard. And so it became very easy to help your children access, know what to do, and help them at home. Google Classroom, parents do not have access to Google Classroom, so you have to get access through your children. And sometimes you don't even know what's on there. For example, my son lost his Chiam Music membership because I didn't realize it was on Google Classroom. Um, so that's, I think, a gap that I think some parents have expressed to me frustrations on. Um, and same thing with measuring screen time. I know I have people who've asked me, how do I measure my children's use of screen time? And they don't, I've heard inconsistent responses as to whether we can send them that, those metrics. So these are some of the specifics that I think I'm hearing about FCPS on. I agree, I think having some time to pause and, ref and learn best lessons before taking on to middle school, I think is valuable. I mean, the, the $50 fee for IEPs is one great example that we still don't have a great system to address. Um, I wanna bring up really quick what I brought about the amendment for the special education review. I wanna be clear, I understand the audit committee is looking at it, I understand there's a forum. What I was trying to, to get to is I think the review is more than just an audit of what we are currently doing, but a look at best practices, because I feel like in some ways our programs have not been looked at holistically for a long time. And that's what I, that's what, and then um, the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is about our talent acquisition versus call me mister. I'd like to see the data on where, I understand it's important to have diverse teachers and we, we need to make sure we have diverse teachers, but where's the data on where the holes are? Is it at recruitment? Is it at hiring? Is it at mentoring? Is it at retention? So it's call me mister, which seems like a recruitment program. Is that the best way to address the needs for our diverse teachers? Is it at hiring practices? And that, that's training for our, for our principals and, and hiring staff. I just don't know if, I don't know where the data is behind that and what the difference is between that and our talent acquisition additions that we're adding to our staff. If we're adding talent acquisition staffing, can they cover some of those needs as well? And that also goes to um, our, I know. So, Tom, yeah. sorry, I'll stop there. But those are just some of my questions and thoughts. One specific item I can address is the Blackboard and Google Classroom. We have recently selected a new tool called Schoology, which, will, which is going to be replacing Blackboard and is 
fully integrated with, with the Google uh, suite. And so we'll be basically replacing Google Classroom and Blackboard into Schoology. So that's something that we are in the process of, of implementing in all our schools. And, and if I could just real briefly, you asked some great questions about the survey questions. These are just samples. There's dozens of questions in the evaluation, and the evaluations are linked in this presentation. Um, and also, um, the evaluation itself is a very comprehensive evaluation. It looks at survey results, it examines the survey results, and then uses that information to ta tailor focus groups with stakeholders and to tailor specific interviews with stakeholders and classroom observations, looking to measure the change in practice and the changes in student learning. Um, and I certainly hear a number of board members asking a lot of questions about the evaluation. Um, again, Johns Hopkins would be happy to answer specific questions. I would be happy to dig into the evaluation findings with any individual board members in more detail. Um, and Johns Hopkins uh, program evaluators would also be happy to come and meet with the board um, prior to the adoption of the budget if that was something that the board chose to do. Thank you so much. All right, I have Ms. Pekarski, Mr. Frisch, and then Ms. Omish. Thank you. Something I wanted to talk about, you know, when we're talking about the budget and we're talking about our values and our, and our priorities, um, I think there is a lot of fortitude on this board and there has been some talk in audit committee and some people have brought it up to do a more comprehensive special education review. I think we all would agree that in order to um, be better, we need to know where the gaps are, where the holes are in that respect. Um, while I absolutely 100% support immediate ways to um, help students and help teachers of, of kids with um, differing abilities, I want to depack, and you don't necessarily need to, no, well, unpack rather, um, <laughs> the elementary special education chair position. And if that is going to drive student success, the equity behind giving a half-time position to some schools, how are those schools going to be you know, chosen um, on the heels of perhaps a comprehensive review? If that is the best way to spend that money right now, because I think many would agree once we put something in, it's really hard to take away. So while I am 100% in support of providing relief and help immediate, because I think it's overdue, I want us to have that conversation. And another thing, um, so that that is um, just an overarching thing I want to talk about. And just one quick question. When it comes to screen time, that is something we keep hearing about. It's a real concern. You know, I have my own kids. It is like policing. Uh, why is there no way for us to to track screen time on these individual laptops to see where the kids have been, uh, how much time they're spending to help par empower parents to see, you know, Today you're not going to use any more at home because you've, you know, you watched YouTube, but I don't know, during block time or why can't we do that? I think Arlington tried to dip their toes into this. Where are we with that? So we recently did an cost. RFP. We recently did a, a procurement solicitation for tools to help do some of that monitoring. And so we had a, a bunch of teachers and administrators and IT central office folks as well, instructional services. And we had vendors come in and present their tools and whatnot. And quite frankly, the tools that, that were presented caused a significant amount of workload on the teachers to set up and to monitor. And so we've gone out, we've, you know, we continue to look at this marketplace, and they're not really that great in terms of the tools. They're expensive, and they don't really provide the tools, that, the, the information we need. So we're continuing to look at that marketplace in general. One of the things I've also heard a couple of people say that the people are walking, watching Netflix on their FCPS on laptop, and that is not true. Those are blocked both at school and at home. So I just want to clarify that just in case anybody had a question on that. So we are continuing to look at some of those tools. We have evaluated them. We will continue to evaluate them as the market uh, progresses in this field, um, but right now those tools are expensive and they don't really give us the data we really want in terms of uh, managing screen time overall. We can provide additional information on the products that yeah. were that we came yeah, in. Yeah, I don't want to belabor yeah, the but. point, but I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ms. Karski, is, is there anything else in the budget you wanted to weigh in on based on the what you shared in your two by twos? You all good? Okay. All right, uh, we have uh, 
Mr. Frisch, Ms. Omish, and then Ms. Marin. Thank you. Um, I think Dr. Brabrand said it when he talked about when we have things like FCPS on and other initiatives, fidelity of implementation is the most potentially problematic thing. Um, when we talk about giving every student a computer, we're not talking about equity necessarily, we're talking about equality. Equity would be asking, are they all getting from the computer the same benefit? And if we're not measuring that in any quantifiable way other than anecdotal, we don't have a way of answering that question. Um, to the question about tracking, I, I do have a question about uh, your answer to uh, Stella's question. Um, you said that it would be difficult for the teachers to set up and it would take time for them to, to look at. Um, w why isn't there just a passive application that can be put on the computer that either a parent or a teacher can look at? We're not just talking about a teacher wanting to know whether the kids are using the software and platforms that we want them to. We also want parents to be able to check those things as well. So we can get back to you on a, you know, on a written response to that in terms of some of the tools that we have looked at and what they, what they off offer, what they don't offer. And, and we also do have some data, for example, on the usage of, Google, of, Google, of our Google accounts and some of those things that we can provide information on. So in terms of, but in terms of having a sort of a comprehensive look at all tools, because again, some teachers are using certain tools. I mean, there are literally hundreds, of, if not thousands of different tools that are used. And so some of these tracking things work with some of the tools, not with other tools. So again, I can try to provide a little bit more information about what the offerings are and what we can do and what we can decide if we want to pay for or not. All right. It just seems to me that it'd be uh, something easier than it's being presented. I can look at my phone right now and tell every application and how long I've used it, period. Um, as to the question about Netflix, I've seen kids watching Netflix on their FCPS computers. If I can access news sources that are blocked from uh, a service provider by doing a few things, kids do the exact same thing. And when one of them knows how to do it, thousands of them know how to do it. Um, Beside the point, I want to say that I do support FCPS on, and I support it when it's implemented with fidelity. I want to make sure that every kid is getting from FCPS on what they should be getting, that the kids in classrooms where the teacher isn't using it are being noticed. Um, that would be actually fulfilling all of the things that we're talking about here. Other subjects, uh, I'd like to see the budget put aside money for the eventual implementation of uh, middle school start times. Um, I know that when we did high schools, there was a upfront cost and then we absorbed year after year. Perhaps we can put money aside now so that the upfront cost is not as severe once we get a report back on how much that will cost. Um, the equity fund, which is something extremely important, um, I'd still like to see uh, us consider moving that into elementary schools as well. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Um, Ms. Omish, Ms. Marin, and then Ms. Dernat Kofax. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I've been reserving my comments on FCPS on. I think my colleagues have done a good job of asking, uh, and I'm certainly following and thinking about what um, I'd like to talk about uh, in upcoming meetings. Uh, I, I wanted to stay a little bit big picture. Um, Again, and just thinking, you know, this presentation we're going to be bringing to the Board of Supervisors here, the first step, I wanted to obviously clarify, I used the term cost cutting. Clearly, what we mean here is reallocation, right? So use, utilizing those funds in, um, in ways that are, are larger priorities for us. Um, but in any case, you know, that's the first step, right, is making our case that we've done our due diligence. The second piece would be uh, presenting our asks, and that's what we're discussing here. But then the other piece I'm going to emphasize again, um, is, is showing how much of a deficit we still are at. So uh, again, I'm, looking at, I'm thinking of best practices as just one example when it comes to ratios of certain staff, being hundreds behind on certain categories. Those are things that, I mean, if the state ends up imposing, you know, the laws that are currently on the floor, I mean, we're going to be looking at 17 million here, 5 million there that we're going to have to come up with. Um, and that I know, you know, we've, we've included here as things we're looking at, um, but should be, you know, aspect of our need. These are needs. These are not going to be, um, you know, things that 
or potentially just for a staffing initiative. I think, especially when I look at the staffing placeholder, when I see th dropout prevention, equity per pupil, the, and that, there's the counselor's piece, which is a small percentage of what we would eventually need to pay, right? Um, these are, I, I don't know that these are extras. I mean, these are also needs. So to me, when we present this to the Board of Supervisors, I, I, I don't understand how we're gonna present a request without showing the extreme deficit we're still at, if for nothing else, but to make a point and to show that, all right, moving forward, how are we gonna get there? Um, if, if you know we are doing our due diligence to reallocate as much as possible and find efficiency everywhere that we can, and still we find that we have these needs. And maybe it is a statement to be able to say, you know what, we've done our due diligence, we really have looked at efficiency, we've made these changes to move in that direction, but we still have $2 billion that we need. And maybe we won't get it, but the, I still find there to be extreme importance to doing that because, again, we're not just talking about luxury here. These are needs, um, b best practice levels that we're not meeting. And then the other piece that I think big picture we may not be considering, I would love to hear from staff. I don't know what, what was made in this direction, but especially with these technology things, clearly there's consternation about what we want to do here. Um, one is there's always the idea of perhaps making this conditional on certain policy that we put to ensure that the concerns of the community are being met um, or addressed. And the second piece is, have we explored partnerships? I mean, private partnerships that this could be a horrible idea, but, but putting it forward here, especially since it, you know, one of the things mentioned in the presentation is it's a priority for one Fairfax as an equity piece outside of even our schools, right? So is there external funding? Is, can this be requested as its own um, thing here, especially in, in support of one Fairfax? I mean, through the foundation, whether it's corporate, corporate sponsorship that can pay for just the laptops, I think there's room to explore that. And, and Again, I know I'm, I'm you know, potentially putting things out there that may not be the normal process, but I really want us to kind of think outside that box of how we can be creative about the money we don't have here. Thank you, Ms. Amish. Um, I, I would make a request, Dr. Brabrand, that again, given we have such a new board uh, and a lot of this started many years ago prior, um, it would be great as a follow-up to this work session if um, we could just get a brief summary that talks about the fact that the pilot wasn't just in the Chantilly Pyramid, but that there was the, ba the e-backpack schools and you know, was there any other um, corporate support um, as we were doing that and the, the funding that came from that. Um, Ms. Loveglass, I believe um, we have over the years had uh, some sort of corporate support uh, with technology. So I, I think just having that follow-up would be helpful. And just to drive the, the broader conversation, it's not about for next Thursday necessarily. Okay, I have Ms. Marin, Ms. Koufax, and then uh, Dr. Anderson and I will take our turns. Sure. So, you know, I... I see how much thought is put into this process and how, you know, we have some incredible programs and resources and thinking here. And I think, you know, with our, our new board, we're bringing a lot of new perspectives and ideas and requests. So that's gonna take a little bit of adjustment and I certainly recognize that. I think we've spent a lot of time talking tonight about how kids learn and that's certainly focused on FCPS on. And, you know, I go back and forth and I, I try and think, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good and it makes sense to give kids technology that's needed. But I agree with what's been said, it's gotta be you know, measured, it's gotta be with the professional development, with the, the right supports. But um, you know, I also agree with the project-based learning that is in our programs, and that's you know, how kids learn. But we haven't gotten to talk about the what, you know, what kids are learning. And again, I'll go back to what we heard the other night from students where they wanna talk about their careers and what the content is that they're learning. And, you know, I don't know how to put it in yet to this budget or this time, but the, you know, hands-on experience, the community connectedness, the more place-based learning, which I understand now is an option, right? You can do place-based learning and or you can maybe do a Get to Green program and or you could do Global Classroom. Um, there's a lot of options and this gets to that teacher overwhelm piece, right? There's so many options, they seem limitless, but they're not. And I think showing our students that you have to make choices in life and not get overwhelmed, if we can model that with a good parameter of options that we know are working well, um, I think that would be exciting. Like I really, for me in this budget, we haven't talked a lot about what kids are learning. But it's important to talk about the skills in the portrait of graduate, but I'd like to, again, know how are we evaluating the programs that are about what kids are learning and how they're learning. But um, 
I just am thinking about that everyday classroom experience and how does this budget make that very robust for each kid. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Um, I have Ms. Koufax. Thank you, and I really do appreciate listening to my colleagues and your ideas. I will say, Ms. Omesh, we have done that before. I think that's an idea, and maybe right now we are being too cautious by presenting our budget this way. Um, what we did um, years ago was we, and that was, if you recall, um, you know, the eight years I sat on this board, six of the years it was cut, cut, cut and nothing, and, and prior to that, it was many years of cutting. So for the last two years is the first time we've been at this point where we can chipping away a little bit. But we have had in the past, Dr. Brabrand, and I'm sure you have access to that, um, a list of what a real needs-based budget would be. I mean, there are so many things, passions of former colleagues that aren't here. There's nothing in here about foreign language. I had an entire list about what needs to happen earlier when I talked about, you know, English as second language as learners, um, how we're going to, you know, uh, uh, how we're going to equalize the Title I funding that may be disappearing nationally and federally. Um, so all of these things are, I think, important, and I think it's good to bring ideas up again and remind us what we did in the past, and maybe we can re refurbish it. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, I do think, um, you know, the and I appreciate, and, I, and I'm hearing people juggling and, and thinking about FCPS on, but for me, um, and again, it's my tenure on the board, I remember going to parts of the county where they were talking about putting buses with Wi-Fi on it to get, to get some kids' connectivity in their neighborhoods. We were talking about ha kids having to go to the library to see that we are so much further in just a few years, mm -hmm. and then to, to know that this could have access to middle school kids. And I, Ms. Marin just used that, that comment, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. And um, you know, I, I w looked forward to continuing to have conversations with you, but I think when I look at equity, I look at there are some kids who still do not have this. And the more we can get in their hands, the more that, more that aligns with one Fairfax, the more that aligns with a caring culture, and the more that aligns with student success. So while I absolutely know that we need to have robust dialogue and data on success, um, I think we've heard from particularly some of the principals who said this rollout has been a long time and the middle school principals are feeling that they have been supported and they're feeling they're ready for the rollout. So um, again, I, I feel strongly about this one and I look forward to answering questions from my colleagues and, and, and supporting you in whatever data you want to, to, to need to help make a decision one way or the other. Perfect timing, Ms. Koufax. Thank you so much. Um, just kind of getting a little bit to my um, amendments, Lee. I'm going to be very clear about my budget amendments. I want to throw in my support. Obviously, I'm in full support of um, FCPS on, and I would really like for us to get to that place where we can work out the, the challenges that have been presented so that we can offer this opportunity. Because the sad story that Ms. Um, Koufax just shared exists in my community as well. And it is heartbreaking to know what our kids don't have access to. Um, speaking of access, I'd like to go ahead and formally add a budget amendment for equity per pupil. Um, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to bridge the gap for our students. I'm looking forward, Dr. Brabrand, to further information in terms of how we will determine which schools will have the opportunity to benefit from this expenditure. I also want to throw in my full support behind the elementary education, special education chairs. Um, the task at elementary school, it's, it's huge, it's huge, and it is really so hard to manage. However, we determine that we're going to um, dole out those 70 positions. I think you'll be presenting some things to us very shortly in terms of some options um, to take a look at. Um, I also want to go ahead and move for a budget amendment for the dropout prevention. And speaking to the principals um, in our area, this has been instrumental in making a difference. You know, justice is working from moving to uh, uh, being um, 
accredited with conditions, you know, false church had a very similar issue and they poured so much energy to go from red to green on this measure. This is what our, co our community needs. I'm just going to speak for Mason very specifically. Um, I also want to have some conversation regarding the substitutes. I, I don't know if the conversation should be a full-time sub substitute being hired for each of the schools that shows up at a, you know, every day or increasing the pay, but we must be able to have this conversation and to offer some relief because when we have um, fill rates that are very low, the impact on a school building can just be devastating because it impacts your PD plans, it impacts so much of the daily operations, not to mention the burden on the teachers who then have to corral and find some way to supervise and teach the students who are now, with, who are now without um, a monitor or a teacher. Um, I also want to throw my support behind increasing the IP, the IA pay scale um, to increase that adjustment. It is hard. And maybe the conversation um, I'd like to throw um, out is maybe it's not a tiered approach for, you know, folks with a degree, but maybe it's a tiered approach for program because some of the programs are harder to staff than others, as we talked about a little while ago. Uh, middle school start times, I'm waiting with bated breath here and I'm up to my two seconds. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, I'll take my final remarks and then uh, kind of wrap this up for the board uh, so we know how to be prepared for uh, the weekend and uh, going into next week's vote. Um, first of all, I will say that um, when we talk about our budget reflecting our values, um, I have said this in all of our work sessions and it bears repeating. It troubles me deeply that one of the best things this board ever did in my eight years of service was that we got later high school start times. It troubles me deeply that this division has said it hasn't been able to find the money and the commitment to get later start times for our middle schools. And yet, leading with, with Dr. Garza, um, your predecessor, the second they got excited and jazzed up on FCPS on, boy, oh boy, didn't this division get creative in how it could find the money. And so I, I had a follow-on motion with Ms. With Ms. Evans, uh, the Mason predecessor, just last May, in the last budget vote, we absolutely directed the superintendent that we wanted to get middle school start times done. We wanted it to get started. We wanted, we knew it would take a multi-year process because you've got to find out the different solutions and then what it will cost and then you've got to run it through the community. So it's not going to be done in a year. No one expects it to be for a year. And I know Dr. Brabrand is, is trying to bring it to us as soon as possible. But I am going to get on my soapbox because I don't know how much it's going to take to drive the message home. I am so proud of the new board members who've joined on and your chorus of voices of understanding middle school start times. I will still lay my marker down that if you interviewed or surveyed our middle school parents, I bet you by a, a very large margin, they want a later, healthier start time for their kid in middle school before you put a laptop in their hand. That is what's frustrating to me about what we're finding ourselves with this whole focus on one thing and where has been the passion to understand the brain research on it. So um, that's my soapbox on that one. Um, and so to my colleagues, I will be talking with all of you about some follow on motion language again, because I'm just, I don't want any more delays. And when you talk about a value, I find it almost troubling. The other thing is that, um, uh, I'm very glad we're going to do the elementary school principal pay parity. That's something I've championed for several years now, and I applaud Dr. Braybrand for putting this in the budget. It's long past due. Uh, the other thing that concerns me is school nurses. Another follow-on motion, I asked this division. I still haven't gotten the answers. And where's the commitment when we talk about you know, impacting students and the need in this school system? There's nobody championing it, and so it's not in the budget, and I think that's a, that's a problem. Um, the other thing is there are, are suggestions for doing good things, like call me mister, but no details whatsoever about the success of this program in other places. So those are going to be the things that I'm going to be asking for in follow-on motions. Um, so my time is up. Uh, before we conclude, I would just ask any colleagues, is there 
anything burning that you really feel you need to say now because the next time we're at the table together is going to be the night of the budget vote. Thank you. Seriously, for all the work that's been put into this and for all the work that the, our colleagues have put into it as well. I just wanted to echo what um, Dr. Anderson said about permanent subs. That's been in every principle that I've spoken to. Um, the fill rate is, it's scary. And then we're putting our admins again in the classroom, which is lovely and not what we are, are supposed to be doing. So I, I've asked for that as well. Uh, yeah, th I echo, thank you. Um, and I really hope that I can see something that, you know, gives the B Board of Supervisors some confidence in our due diligence so that I can feel confident voting on this. Thank you. Yes, in every note I've ever taken, I brought it up and I forgot to say it, middle school start times, I support it. I have for many years. We promised it years ago. It is a direct impact on student health, which will in turn impact academic success in the classroom. It's time I want us to do it. I really do. I do uh, want to say thank you. I know there's been a lot of work and I've asked a lot of, we've asked a lot of questions in the last few days and probably kept some people up at night. So I want to recognize that. Um, and I know there's more work to be done. I really am looking for a more holistic, um, w the way that we look at this budget. And, and I know we may not be able to get to it, um, but I, um, I do support, I, I, I support the IA's uh, budget issue. Um, in terms of bringing some level of parity for them. I, I am intrigued to look at the middle school start times and how that can happen. And um, I am also extremely concerned about mental health. And um, I didn't see, I'm looking for more, I'll, in the next week I'll be looking to see um, how I can add to what's already in here. Um, but. And, you know, I just need a broader understanding. I've tried to, to get to that. And, and these SIFE students, um, that is a, a huge concern for me because I understand um, in my work there are um, uh, undocumented children coming here, children who are traveling from areas where they either have had interrupted or no education at all. And um, I have visited schools where um, our a teachers, our staff members have done heroic things to try to compensate. Um, and we need to recognize what, um, what those needs uh, require. So uh, I look forward to discussing that. Um, one of the things that I did not um, talk about because I didn't want to go ahead before we got the AAP report, but I am, I am really looking forward to that because in AAP redesign, we provide greater access by bringing level four service to all of our elementary schools and middle schools is also something that I'm very interested in. And I also want to share support for the elementary principal pay. Um, I think that's definitely overdue. Thank you. I do just want to say thank you to everyone that's been sitting here for hours and all of answering questions and preparation. Um, I really do appreciate that. And, um, you know, waking up in the middle of the night over the past week thinking, oh my gosh, you know, the, the vote is next week. <laughs> um, I've just kind of called myself understanding that we have, you know, we're presenting to the Board of Supervisors and we have to vote next week on what's going forward, but we do have months of conversations that will be happening around all of these big topics. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Um, I want to echo the thank you as well, and I just want to echo a little bit about what Dr. Brabrand said about recognizing that we are all new and this is a lot to sort of start not one month into the job. Um, but I want to flip that around and say I also recognize how difficult it must be for all of you to have done all this work for all these months and then have to deal with a board who's brand new and asking probably questions you may have been asked before and, and things you're like, I've talked about this forever and now I have to talk about it again. So I do, I do want to recognize that 
that I appreciate the patience that you all have had with us as well. Um, I do want to read a couple things. I, I want to uh, to go back with the special education compliance. I agree. We, we, we are overdue support. Our teachers, our retention is the worst. I, I'm walking an audit and review, but I do, we do need to give some support and relief now while we do that. And, and that's what Ms. Pekarski said. And I just want to really say w this is important. So um, IA pay, middle school start times, all of those um, sub shortages, those are pieces of our teacher burnout and workload issues. I think those will help those. So I'm going to leave it at that. But I just want to say thank you for your patience as well. Um, I'll say on, on a, I support so many of the, the items in the budget. I think all the things we can do to retain our staff and give them a healthy working environment that can then let our children's learn in a, children learn in a healthy way, I, I support that. Um, relatedly, middle school start times, yes, I support that. Um, looking into that and, and figuring out how to make that work. Um, I think, you know, in thinking about we're new, you've done work, but like use us as an opportunity to go to the next level. You know, we're, we're eager to do it. So um, we, we've, we've got a, a long road, but like, let's, we can do it together. So thank you for everything, really. It's a phenomenal work. Thank you. Uh, I think I shared with everyone um, my thoughts for the budget at this point. Remember, we will have, as some of the colleagues have noted, many more opportunities to discuss, and it will be a great opportunity to um, have these formal and informal conversations with the Board of Supervisors at our retreat. So, and with that, I do want to thank you all for being here tonight, particularly Mr. Martin Grimm, my principal at Hayfield Secondary. It is Mr. Grimm's birthday tonight, oh, so. Happy still. birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Martin. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. That was very nice. Thank you all. Um, I'm not going to add to the budget discussion tonight, but I do want to remind our colleagues that we have a joint board meeting or joint retreat with the Board of Supervisors on Monday, and it's going to be an incredible opportunity to explore with them lots of areas of common um, priorities, both in our uh, budget as well as in our CIP and really establish a norm for the two boards going forward, um, which we can build on uh, past work, which is the norm of we are two boards working together on behalf of one Fairfax. And so the more that we collaborate and um, share ideas on uh, our priorities and how we can build upon each other's priorities, um, it makes Fairfax a better place for students to be educated in, uh, a better place for our families to live, and a better place for businesses to come to because it's such a great place. So I am looking forward to the first joint retreat of the two boards. And Dr. Brabrand, thank you for all of your hard work and the hard work of this dream team behind you um, in uh, preparing for this work session and all the other work for the uh, budget. Thank you for uh, letting me have a final comment here at the end. Um, just two or three quick things from the nugget and then a wrap up thought. Uh, we have a sub task force um, Dr. Nixon's leading it right now. We're getting a broad array of people together to do problem of practice. Um, I think there could be final recommendations before May in the approved budget to bring some ideas, whether they're budgetary or non-budgetary. Sub-task force, substitute task force. Several of you mentioned this in this last round. That's why I just wanted to mention it. The AAP study, we have booked with the consultant the final recommendations um, Dr. Ivey has. I believe it's March. March 24th, you'll be hearing final recommendations from the AAP consultant. And remember that placeholder is in there. Again, another thing that you'll be able to have time to still weigh in on. Um, and then finally, um, I just want to reflect on tonight, there was a lot of passion, right? Not everybody had the same point of view. Um, but I really saw the board willing to collaborate with us. And I appreciate that. And I want to say also, I am touched at how many of you personally thank the staff tonight. This is a hardworking team 
who believes. I believe in ser servant leadership, and this team believes in servant leadership, and we want to partner with you to make FCPS the best possible. That's always been our goal. That's our spirit. I know, you know, uh, I can only be responsible as superintendent for what's happened the last two and a half years, and there's a longer history to that, and I've learned through the equity journey, Dr. Duran's helped me, that everybody, where, where do you come into that journey? What's been your own experience with this system? But this system, this team is committed to equity, it's committed to excellence, and it's committed to effectiveness. And we're gonna do that in every topic, including on this budget. And we look forward to working with you uh, over the next week and in the weeks and months ahead. And thank you, Chairman McLaughlin, for doing, a, a, in my view, an amazing job tonight to really bring the board together and set the tone for our meeting with the Board of Supervisors on Monday. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Dr. Braybrand. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have a great vice chair, Dr. Anderson, um, working with me as a partner. And uh, to my colleagues, I do want to just tell you how much I appreciate how hard you all work to clear your calendars and uh, be very flexible to try with some of our rescheduling. Uh, but meeting those two by twos, uh, along with um, our CFO Lee Burden and Alice Whittington, who sat through all tw uh, 11 of the 12 discussions. Uh, so uh, at your time investment, 10 hours and more counting on just those two by two discussions alone, but I think they were meaningful. Um, Housekeeping wise, I mentioned this beginning, I want to reiterate it again. Um, please, by tomorrow, if at all possible, if there are any amendments or even follow on motions that you would like to consider, you're welcome to reach out to me to discuss it along with Dr. Anderson. But since I've gone through this a bit, also um, any of the other veteran board members, if you want to talk about just where you're thinking on it, we want to serve as a resource to you going through your first budget experience. But the main thing is, is you don't have to have the technical language. Just send in an email to Lee Burden, Alice, um, and uh, copy uh, me on that as well, and Eileen Mulberg, uh, the clerk of the board. This is just a way that we can get those in. They will then work on the technical language for you, along with any costs that might be associated with it. Uh, but the sooner you get whatever proposals you're wanting to consider, and again, by 5 p.m. tomorrow is ideal. However, if you come up with a robust conversation over the weekend and something comes to mind, your best thinking matters. You bring something by 9 a.m. on Monday, that's gonna still give us time to be able to do something. So again, amendments and follow on motions. I also wanna remind everybody that uh, we also have the CIP vote the very same night. So consider being judicious with your amendments and follow on motions. Again, this is just the beginning, but where it's a value is to help Dr. Braybrand and his team start to prepare for where this board is on, on where we're going to be going as we head toward May. So uh, with that, um, we are adjourned for the Can evening. Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Oh, yes. yes. So I just, should we expect to receive an updated version to review before we vote or like what is gonna happen? So the proposed budget stands. That there's nothing that's been changed on the proposed budget. Um, so th there's nothing to see other than we will, you will also be copied on any and all amendments and follow on motions that your colleagues are gonna present. And that's again for your review. Um, and then the advocacy that will be, that you, I recommend you do if there's anything you're proposing anywhere starting tomorrow through um, up to the Thursday evening vote. So we're reviewing that ahead of time. We're not just getting it on Thursday, correct? Correct. What we yeah. try to do is you submit your draft language for your, your amendments or follow-on motions. Once you get the language the way you like it, then it can be posted publicly and you can begin your conversations. You can begin your conversations anytime, but it's a way for board members to be seeing. And then um, Ms. Mulberg as clerk, I would say if we can uh, start almost developing a document that says, here's the next updated one so that people don't necessarily have to keep logging into the agenda to go find it. It would be great if we keep a running tally of amendments that are being added and, and uh, follow on motions. Okay? We, yeah, after the, we'll do this after the deadline, but 
I'll work on the logistics, don't you worry, but we'll make sure that we get it so that you have an easy way of reviewing it, okay? Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.